And so we grew a internet marketing agency. I was doing uh, multi-million dollars in revenue and very high margin. We ran something in uh, people getting out of credit card debt. And I actually like defaulted on bills to understand what it felt like to be a consumer in credit card debt. I wanted to go through the process. I wanted to feel how it felt like to be my consumer. A bit of a taboo statement. One of the, the best ways to learn is on someone else's dime. I think when we first started, we were getting paid like $40 a phone call. And at its peak, we were getting paid $120 a phone call. And it was the exact same customer, exact same product, exact same person. The only difference that happened was my relationship with them. I'm hitting the guy on LinkedIn, borderline stalking him to get in touch with him, become friends with him on Instagram. I got a front row seats to the Chicago Bears. I replied to his stories. Like, this is all shit I would do. And I became such good friends with him. I was working on a contract for eight months. Within two weeks, I had a contract on my desk after doing that. This is the reality where I can actually make yeah. more money faster when everyone else is all only talking about apps. Welcome to the WGMI podcast, where we talk about the nitty gritty tactics of underground entrepreneurs. The goal of this podcast is that you fully understand their business model and have strategies and tactics that you can immediately implement in your business. So if you enjoy this type of content, subscribe to our free newsletter. But other than that, enjoy the episode. All right, Anthony Sarandria. Thanks for coming here, brother. How are you doing today? Doing great, man. Dude, it's good to see you. Thanks for good to see you. I am Please. super excited to talk to you today, mainly because our, not our interests, but we work kind of in the same field or right. you're, but you're like the master. And so selfishly, I think I'm going to be able to learn a lot from this podcast. But if you guys don't know, Anthony is a master affiliate marketer, master at driving traffic and lead gen specifically. And now he's pursuing his passion and making music and performing at EDC as a DJ, which Sorry. in and of itself is like the dream, <laughs> find financial success, then pursue your passion at the highest level. So, so much to learn here, but first again, you know, I love asking people how much money they make. He sold his company to a public company and obviously can't talk about it, but he's doing very, very well for himself. So let's just go ahead and start with affiliate marketing sure. and break down specifically. Could you just kind of high level, what is affiliate marketing? Of course. And then maybe talk about like what makes a good affiliate marketing partnership? Absolutely. So we'll start on the uh, advertiser side. So you've got a company that could be a direct to consumer product. So, uh, and that's, that's usually what it is. Could be business to business as well too. But um, essentially how it works is companies looking for uh, uh, a way to ger generate more sales to their, uh, to their product or their service or whatever that is. And oftentimes it's a really um, low risk for them because it's commission only salesperson, right? So mm. if you have a, uh, a chair company, I might say, hey, I'll give anyone $50 if they can sell one of my chairs. So it's really like if you think about it in the simplest terms. It's uh, they're hiring commission only salespeople gotcha. and you're a commission only salesperson. Okay. So it's basically like this company lets you sell their product and they give you a commission or a percentage. Exactly. Okay. So super simple. So when you started affiliate marketing, maybe early or middle part of your journey, sure. what were you looking for when it came to like who to partner with? Cause you could work with like a hundred different companies. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And that's the one interesting thing being a commission only salesperson you get to kind of be the the hot girl or you get to be the selective person, right? <laughs> like it's like not necessarily the other way around. Whereas like I started with a traditional internet marketing agency where we were selling, you know, five grand a month, 10 grand a month, whatever it is, contracts to run their mm. Google AdWords or SEO or whatever that right. is. And at that case, really, you're getting interviewed a lot by the company we're here yeah. because you're the commission only salesperson. You're doing a lot of interviewing. So, mm. excuse me. So a couple of things I'm looking for in an offer in general. One is um, the cost tolerance they have for it. I mean, mm. How much can they pay for it? So coffee cups, and they're going to give a $2 bounty. It's a very small, small margin to go actually acquire a customer, especially if it's through paid traffic right. or even organic. There's not a huge bounty. Um, so I'm looking for something that really, if you're asking me, like has at least a $500 CPA, which is essentially cost per acquisition. That's the, the bounty for the actual product or service that it is for them to actually get a sale on it. But then I've got enough margin to go. In my world, I'm a, I'm a paid ads guy. To go actually acquire a customer, okay, hundred bucks. So I'm looking for a, I'm a high mark. So you're selling a high ticket product, and you're saying you're interviewing these companies. Um, yeah, I, I use interviews kind of like loosely. I'm not like sitting down across the table. Yeah. Them, but like if you're so if you're just getting started, there's there's Offer Vault. There's a, a ton of these are Rakuten and all these things where you can go ClickBank. ClickBank. That's the one I've heard of. Yeah. Exactly. We can go look at all of these these offers on there, and a lot of times it's a really good place to start because if you get in touch with an account manager, you can say. Hey, here's, I think I'm either I'm good at, I've got a great YouTube organic channel mm -hmm. or I'm really good at Facebook ads, or I think I'll be good at blank Facebook mm -hmm. ads. 
what are some offers that you see people making a lot of money on today or doing a lot of revenue, right? Like they won't know the exact profit that the person's getting. Okay. So go a step further and like get some inside information. 100%. Don't and just sign up right away. 100%. Okay. And I would just, I would ask them, I'd say, hey, here's where I think my traffic or customers are going to come from. And um, who do you currently have today that's doing really well on mm -hmm. what offers? And a lot of times these, we'll call them middlemen is what they, what they are, like a, like a ClickBank or something yeah. like that. Where they know all the advertisers like we talked about and right. dive into that. They know all the publishers, which is like me and you, the people that have the traffic. Mm -hmm. And then they kind of sit in the middle and kind of broker the deal in between. So their value really is, um, I think, underutilized for a lot of people. I think people should really utilize them for really what they're making all the money for is helping download you on what's going to work and cut the learning curve for you versus going mm. Google and searching, you know, top chair companies and then emailing each one and getting it off there as a, as a silly analogy. So a chair company would be something that's in line with maybe a $500 CPA, like a luxury, like... I just made that up. Okay. He <laughs> was like, um, we did a lot of financial services and insurances. Oh, okay. So mortgage is a great example. Like I did lead generation, so I didn't actually do physical products. I was selling like uh, Medicare insurance or private health insurance. And when I say selling, I was driving a customer to fill out a form or call in. And then I was using um, one of those advertiser partners. Their call center would actually enroll someone in the product. Those products are worth, you know, high lifetime value mm. so they can afford to pay... 500 to a thousand two thousand dollars to actually get a new customer yeah because they're not tangible products it's more like a monthly insurance is like just printing money basically for these people or yeah. selling mortgages i get that so you what what ad traffic were you sending what platform uh, a lot of facebook originally okay. uh, facebook and then we came instagram facebook and we actually had a really good we were one of snapchat's top 10 financial advertisers for snapchat for, yeah snapchat but was yeah. selling for snapchat or on snapchat no i'm sorry on snapchat as like an ad marketing the insurance products on snapchat can anyone sign up for a Snapchat like ads yeah, or is that like private? No, as far as I know, anyone huh. can be on there. Yeah, 100%. You can be on the ad network. Huh, that's cool. exchange. Same thing with TikTok and then with YouTube or Facebook or Google AdWords. Mm. Okay, so for the sake of this conversation, let's focus on one. Let's just say, okay. did you do insurance? Absolutely. Would you say you're an expert on insurance yeah, or you've done it before? Okay, so, and did you learn Facebook ads and Instagram ads from a tr your traditional agency before? Yes. That's exactly so that's kind of how you understood? Yeah, so a lot of times when people are like, how do you get started in affiliate marketing? Because, again, you're a commission-only salesperson, you're you're really putting up, in this case, the ad spend, the right. time, all this stuff. Like, you really got to make sure you're good at it. Like, I think the biggest, it's a bit of a taboo and not a politically correct statement, but I think one of the the best ways to learn is on someone else's dime. So <laughs> when, I, when I had a, first I got a job and mm -hmm. I got paid to spend someone else's money on, on Facebook at the time. Mm -hmm. And I got to learn how that worked on, again, I was getting paid to play with someone else's money. And I had an ad agency where some mm -hmm. people would pay me per month to, again, manage their money. Mm -hmm. So it was very low yeah. low risk for me, low investment. And I was literally getting paid to learn in my head, which felt mm -hmm. amazing. And I, it took until I felt like I was really good to go start putting in my own money because they were my own website. Gotcha. And all this stuff. And at that point, I knew I was pretty pretty good at what I was doing. And I felt a lot more high degree of confidence spending at the time a hundred dollars a day mm -hmm. or a thousand dollars a month or what, you know, whatever it was, yep. putting money into it versus just coming off the street and being like, all right, I'm going to get my feet wet in Facebook ads, which there's nothing wrong with that either. But I, I, I mean, for anyone listening, I would highly prefer to learn. on So you just had to become a great marketer first before you had the comp, not necessarily confidence, but willingness to bet it all on your performance as a marketer. That's exactly right. How did you have the confidence to just even do marketing for other companies though? Like where did you learn or how did you get into that? It's, um, it, it, honestly, it's not like a Cinderella story. I, uh, I was in college. I sorted by the highest paying internship. <laughs> and uh, one of them was a company that I didn't understand what they did. I didn't know what SEO was, web design, mm. anything. I went to it because it was like, at the time, it was 15 bucks an hour. I yeah. Was like freaking. <laughs> you just worked at one. Okay. 2000, uh, 2010. I was like, this is, that's amazing money. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and um, so I, I went there, I interviewed. And, and when I left, I was like, dude, this guy, like jokingly, I told my friend, I was like, that guy, Probably has a crush on me if he hires me because I don't know. <laughs> I I did terrible. Yeah. Calls me back a few days later, hires me, <laughs> and uh, so uh, so that's how I started. I really just got a job. Okay. I got a job. Then you just learned what goes into marketing, and then you started one yourself eventually. You know, I think I think the mindset or takeaway from that was because there's nothing special about getting a job and all this. Like, right. I always like came with the thought that o over deliver from what I'm paid for. Um. So. Very good. Uh, so o over deliver for what I'm paid. So if someone pays you five thousand dollars a month, I'm trying to deliver $10,000 worth of service to them. Someone's paying you 10,000, I'm trying to deliver $20,000 okay. of service. And and even when I had a job at $15 an hour, I would not bill for some hours. I would stay up late. Good flop. Morning, not as, and I was just I was just trying to over deliver in every single way possible. And I think that's something that still to this day sticks with me. And I think that's um 
I think that's that's one of the you know if you said like what's one of the reasons like why you it, I th I think it's just that mindset and commitment to over delivering and I think too often people are looking like you know I worked four hours today like what right are freaking and they're dreams? entitled to it. you know what I mean yeah. there's a lot of entitlement versus again like um they're just over delivering I think that's something I've taken a lot of like pride in with my marketing I would do a lot of free work if I didn't have results I would want to do it and learn it before I sold it to people yeah. where I feel like in the marketing space it's almost like viewed as you just need to like sign as many clients as possible yeah. and then just rack it up where you don't take accountability for the results. That's right. And so I think that mindset is a big indicator of why you're so successful. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. And, and honestly, it just, it makes sense when you, uh, so it makes sense on surface what you just said, why people are selling that. Mm -hmm. And then it makes sense the other philosophy because you become a puppy mill and it's so exhausting. Really? Dealing with, with low, uh, I, I get back to margin, right? Like $500 a month client. I, it's the weirdest thing I, I, I found. <laughs> yeah. And maybe people listening to me. I know exactly what you're talking about. $500 yeah. a month client was infinitely more of a pain in the neck yeah. than a $25,000 a month. 100%. Client. I had this client said, let's meet quarterly. This client would call me on Saturday night saying, what's going on? So to have a $1,500 a month clients seemed miserable. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning when, and, and you have, I think a lot of times, like, you know, it's so easy to say now, like, We'll go work with a public company, United Healthcare, like <laughs> yeah. this company. But at the time, dude, anyone who would pay me for anything, I was doing videography mm -hmm. work. I didn't, me too. Yeah. It was like borrowing a video camera from someone else. Meanwhile, I was selling like paid Facebook ads, like mm -hmm. anything anyone paid paid me for, I would do. <clears throat> but again, as, as as quickly as possible, that over that over delivering, I I, I th this is an interesting one. So I, we grew a internet marketing agency. I was doing uh, multi million dollars in revenue and very high margin. This is my my first business, not the one I just sold. Very high margin business. We never spent a dollar on marketing, and it was because it was all referrals. It was all mm. so my customer would go from a two thousand dollar a month client to a five to a ten to a fifteen thousand because I was again over delivering, adding service. I was upselling them, and I don't say upsell like the dirty word upsell. Yeah, you were mentioning like upsell, <laughs> like let me see where I can jam you, like yeah. adding value that they could pay me for mm -hmm. is like what I think about upselling. And then they would refer me to great people, and I'd get referral partners. Then I'd work with a PR agency that would plug me into ten companies. And again, it's just because we just did, we were committed to doing really good work and I knew the money would follow. And after you see it happen once or twice, it becomes really addicting versus mm -hmm. like if you start off out of the gate saying, okay, let me jam this guy for 500 bucks and <laughs> never look at anything, you know, just see how often I can sh and bill him mm -hmm. for and maybe he won't see. Like, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. You get mm -hmm. negative calls, negative feedback. Mm -hmm. You only get, you know, you and I mentioned a little bit off camera, but y you get one personal brand. I can, mm -hmm. I could run a hundred businesses before mm -hmm. I die, but I get one personal brand. Mm -hmm. And it was, I, that just always, and we were joking, like what a small town it is. Like mm -hmm. uh, that always stuck with me that I get one personal brand. So that commitment to being known as the person who is a really good guy that does really stand up work that over delivers is a hard worker. Like that, that's so important to me. Maybe that's ego. We were talking. Yeah. Ego. Maybe that's ego, but I, I think that's. I don't me. think so. And if it yeah. is, it serves me. But yeah. anyway, uh, all that to be said. <laughs> I mean, back to the referral thing. I mean, that is objectively how agencies will grow. And so you yes. don't do good work, you won't get referrals. And then people will just try to buy courses and figure out why is this not working. That's right. Because no one's telling their friends that they had a good experience with you. But let's go ahead and just go into the tactics now sure. of making those results. Yeah. So let's go back to the insurance example we we're talking about. You're going to run Facebook or Instagram ads. What is your philosophy on driving traffic? Like, what's your funnel look yeah. like? What's your creative, like, sure. break it down? So I actually go the other way real quick on the advertiser okay. side. Because so often, I think people are focused on how to get my CPMs or cost per thousand impressions yeah. or my click, uh, cost per click down or my my, uh, my my cost to drive a lead or a customer. And specifically in affiliate marketing, I think what gets really doesn't get looked at enough is the relationship with the advertiser. Mm. Because a lot of times, if someone says they could pay, let's go back to the chair analogy, they could pay fifty dollars a chair. Mm -hmm. They could really spend one hundred twenty dollars for that to, for that same customer. They're just putting it out there. We'll take anyone at fifty bucks, but that's not truly their threshold of margin. So going upstream and like for me, I'll use a real life example: insurance, right? Like, I think when we first started, we were getting paid like forty dollars a phone call, and at its peak, we were getting paid one hundred twenty dollars a phone call. And it was the exact same customer, the exact same product, exact same person. The only the difference that happened was my relationship with them. Mm. So I was talking to them about scale and the quality I'm driving and the commitment to the brand and and, and, and I can get I can get more in depth with it. But I would I would really focus on if I was just starting an affiliate offer or if I was just started becoming an affiliate, I would really focus on first understanding the brand, understanding understanding their needs. Uh, as quickly as possible, getting to talk to the actual brand themselves, even through the middleman, if you have to, the, the ClickBank at the mm. at the beginning, and understand what are their growth targets, where where are they looking to grow, what products are they looking to grow, what type of customers are actual real customer that they want, 
And through those conversations, you actually become, you said, what did you say, preferred partner? Yeah. You go from being an affiliate to a preferred partner. Mm. And at that point, you're actually like, it's a partnership at that point. So when they have to uh, cut cut um, their marketing dollars, they cut you last. Or mm. the scale, they come to you first. Because a lot of these brands, so funny, like raise a ton of money and they're acquiring customers at all costs. And it doesn't even have to be economical for them. Right. So the chair is worth a hundred bucks and they're charging, they're paying you $200 for the chair just because they're trying to grow less now with the way <laughs> inflation and yeah. <laughs> rates have gone. But still like, um, so anyway, so uh, uh, spending more time with, and tactically what that looks like is flying out and meeting with them, getting face to face. Oh my God. For face to face. Um, actually like, uh, Christmas time, I would know my account manager loved, uh, the Chicago bears and I got a front row seats to the sugar. Uh, this is know, complete first- reverse way of thinking it's about it. hundred percent. And it's like, you know, we were, just, we were jamming about how much we love psychology, but it's really like becoming a really good partner and friends with, with them and doing things other people are in doing, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and you really see it rewarded, uh, wholesomely on the, on the other side for me, at least again, the $40 to 120 on the, you know, this is well. This is reflective of again your success because I feel like a lot of people are attracted to affiliate marketing because on the outside it seems like beginner friendly. You just need to get a link and then start driving tra- traffic as cheaply as possible. Where well, you're going the complete opposite. These people are like trying to hope these people don't know like see yes. them, just trying to collect a check right. on the back end. Where you're like, hey, nice to meet you. Here's a cake for your birthday. Yes. <laughs> Here's whatever. But but to your point, the barrier to entry is nothing. Which right means it's highly competitive. Right. When you start doing things that other people won't do, like I love, like you asked me, like what's the difference of marketing versus like insurance? I said compliancy. And like most people are like, ugh. For me, I love it. The more oops I have to jump through, mm-hmm. the more pain in the neck something yep. is, the more I know that people are not there and I can actually go stand out. So if I can go through and learn compliancy and mm-hmm. go through and become a freaking borderline paralegal at this point where I know exactly how everything you can and can't say, like, I've stood out so much as a partner than everyone else, going to fly in person, all these other things. So doing what others um, aren't doing is exactly, I think, where there's actually edges in the business to make money. Because everyone's trying to see how to, and we'll go through it too, how to get cheaper traffic or how to drive yeah. traffic. Everyone's, like you said, signing up and clicking the link. But like, are you reaching out to the company actually directly, trying to create a relationship there and, and learn, hitting the guy on LinkedIn, borderline stalking him to get in touch with him, become friends with him on Instagram, met, replying to his stories. Like, this is all shit I would do. The advertiser. Yes, the, the account manager at the advertiser. So the the freaking the the guy at United Healthcare. I literally I knew there was a Medicare conference. I had I had a hope that he would be there. I flew out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I got this guy drunk enough where he literally pissed his pants, like no joke. Like, yes, <laughs> and I became such good friends with him. And I was working on a contract for eight months. Within two weeks, I had a contract on my desk after doing that. And that's just stuff that other people aren't doing. And it's uh, when you say contract, do you just mean like more favorable terms, or just to um, advertise for the person directly? So when we go click, you said ClickBank, um, you know ClickBank. Oh, instead of going through ClickBank. As an example, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's the best. We're thing. using that because that's like the mainstream yeah. term. But ClickBank is using ClickBank. Uh, Click, ClickBank is like a, a, we call, I call it like an affiliate network. So it's going around the network directly to the offer is where right. I'll call like the advertiser. In this case, okay. United Healthcare was the offer. Directly with the company. That's gotcha. Right. Directly, directly. That, and you get favorable terms, no fee. 100%. And now you have a relationship with them so you can like actually see what they're looking for and you can actually deliver for them what they want instead of just self viewing it selfishly, which is I think the biggest problem with affiliate marketing. That's right. And the, this, the, and even down to like, um, let, let's go back to that, that, that same like um, uh, uh, moral that we're talking about here. I would bleed sometimes for months when they said, hey, I need to push this new, like um, they were, it's called final expense insurance. It doesn't matter. It's another product. <laughs> yeah. They said, I, I, I need to push this. I, be- I was bleeding over here just to help them grow this. And I would let them know. I'm not saying I would do it just because I'm a nice guy. Like I would let them know that I'm doing them a favor over here, but I would lose money to continue to not only grow the relationship, but strengthen the relationship because so I can make more money over here. Mm. And that's again, that's, those are little things that other people w- won't do or aren't doing in my opinion. But the second you have something working from an affiliate offer, I would I would literally shut my computer about Facebook and minimize that tab and and, and working on my ads and everything. I like I'm, the only thing I'd be focused on is how to go direct with the advertiser and how to strengthen my relationship there because you you know you talking they about, could shut you down at any point. Is, is that what you're saying like to avoid that well, in a way? I'm I'm more saying um, my attention would go towards growing the relationship with the advertiser less about my ads. Mm. And I'm not saying I, I'm saying that to be dramatic because I think. It makes sense. If it's working, don't touch it. But. Yes and no. And I'm sorry, maybe, maybe I'm being too dramatic and funny, but like <laughs> 99.9% of people are focused on their ads. Right. And 0.1% are focused on the advertiser. And I guess I'm just trying to be dramatic and give a shake to say, this is actually where, if you're asking me where I made most of my money, it's not, I, I think myself and my team are unbelievable marketers, so I'm not necessarily trying right. to downplay it, but I'm sure there's much, much better marketers than me, but we were able to make a ton more money because I focused over here versus just over Could you give examples of 
you can sound you might sound narcissistic here sure. but why would this be worthwhile for your own self interest? Yeah, the, uh, that, we're working with advertiser. Yeah, yeah, we met. We, better rates or better, better. So higher payout was one thing we mentioned. Payment terms. So I, I would get down to prepay, whereas like at networks or somewhere else, it was like net sixty. So my cash flow was a lot better. I would, I would better payout. Better payout. Ah, okay. I would learn about the demographic better, so I could actually feed my advertise my what I was doing on ads better because I knew who their actual customer was that brought the highest lifetime value to them. Mm. And so learned what they would be willing to pay more. So they say, okay, well, someone's you know, closer to the age of 65 versus an 80 year old, we can actually pay you a little bit more for that. Oh, well, why don't we set up a dedicated campaign where I just drive you 65 to 70 year olds mm. and you pay me 120 on that and anything over 70 year olds, you can pay me a hundred bucks on. Oh, that's a good idea. Let's do that. So you're actually cutting deals and negotiating. Because I'm understanding the business. Right. And 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 at a minimum, 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 I implore people to do this because they're, they will be such better advertisers, such better advertisers because they'll actually understand what the heck they're selling and who the demographic is. And we talk about like psychology, like well, the mindset of their consumer, like what what, what do they want versus like, I could think that, so get a comfy chair. I'll, go, I'll just keep using this as a silly example because I think it's like- It's, it's easy to understand. Get a comfy chair you're going to love versus if I understood like most people buy a new chair because they have excruciating uh, spa back spasms. I was like, are you tired of back spasms keeping you up? Your messaging, night? yeah. Like my messaging so much better to say, Never experience, never have to take a pain medication again for your back spasms and actually get the first good night's sleep of your life by buying this chair. How much better is that than way better black chair with gold trim that looks really cool? You're going to love it, <laughs> right? Like yeah. I would only know that. And I, I, I use that as an example, like a deep down demographic by talking to my advertiser on and learning about their customers, learning about their needs. You kind of like get their data internally. That's exactly yeah. right. Huh. That's, and that's kind of outcome-based marketing. Don't list all the features. It's gold with this padding. No one knows. They just want to know how it benefits them, 100%. which is the key to marketing, in my opinion. But if you don't understand what the benefit is to the end user... You think it's a flashy video. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Get 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 better, better, better Medicare insurance versus if I knew that average senior is on eight different prescription pills and that, oh my God, the Medicare uh, right coverage covers that. Never pay for a prescription. Mm. You don't know that when you go click on a link and sign up as a Medicare affiliate. You're like, check your insurance if you're over 65. Yeah, I think this is the biggest thing that beginners do. They just think they can get a link real quick, make a gimmicky website in a day, and they need to make money in three days. That's right. Where you're putting like days, months, thousands of dollars into a relationship so you can get the customer data exactly right. and then use that for your marketing campaigns. Yeah. And then on top of that, getting better deals so you have better edges in affiliate marketing, which is super competitive. 100%. 100%. So smart. Thank you. And, and I'm and I'm not doing that necessarily again because I'm a nice guy. I'm a, I'm a capitalist. I want to make 100%. Three, three minutes as well too. But I've just found this is where I can actually make that money. That's the reality. of This is the reality where I can actually make yeah. more money faster when everyone else is preaching to go the, do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like to, the lazy illusion of just yeah. get it done as fast as possible. Anyone can do it. Yeah. Buy my course today. That's exactly right. Yeah. And I guarantee that course is only talking about ads. And, we'll, and let's get into that too on how to run better ads. But they're missing the other piece of the puzzle, which you think about it in theory, like if someone's got a really good brand, really good product, low return rates, upsells, or for me, they have a really good call center. Great, great, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, like can conversion conversion rate optimized flow or something like that. Like, dude, I can send really like not that great of traffic, and they actually kind of like hold weight, like they kind of carry me along the way. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting way to think. That's about interesting, it. yeah. Whereas I don't have wow. to be that great a marketer if I'm if I've got the right partner. They could have just a badass sales team that can enroll freaking anyone with a pulse. That's attractive as hell. That's to do that. Oh, hundred percent. I don't have to even have to be that good at marketing. I think there's something to say about that as well with marketing. Like if you understand the messaging. You don't need like the craziest of crazy creatives. Now, obviously you can and it'll do well at the scale for like TV, but for Facebook, like if you can get the idea or the point across with an ad very concisely, that works. So you don't need some wizard of video to come in and spend 20 grand on an ad. So let's just touch on that because it's, it's something that once you have the science down, you don't really need to learn anymore. Uh, and so sure. kind of break down your philosophy yeah. just real quickly. One quick interruption to the podcast today, guys. I know what we're talking about in this podcast is a little more advanced, so I decided to make a free marketing training for beginners. It's about 30 minutes, but it will teach you everything you need to do step-by-step -step to sell any product or service. So whether you're doing an agency, whether you're doing a software, this really breaks it down into simple terms, how to think about getting your first few customers and even scaling to millions of dollars with a marketing machine. So again, completely free. You can find that in the link below. But back to the episode. Yeah, I'd say a few things. I think one is, uh, just generically speaking, uh, the formula we have is, we'll call it an attention grabber at first. Okay. So it could be, I see you've got like cash over there. It could be that <laughs> cash at the screen, right? Or something like yeah. that, right? Like something that you like got, like for me, it'd be like, get up to a hundred or uh, $1,700 back on your social security check if you're over the age of 65. 
So what I did there is I gave you a really good benefit statement mm-hmm. that stopped the scroll, that got your attention. That's your headline? That 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 could be, I'm using like a video. Let's say okay. like a video, like that might be the first three seconds of my video. That's stop the, the scroll. I gotta, that's the hook. I'm trying to stop the scroll. Then I'm trying to get in the qualifier. If you're over the age of 65 and you're on at least two prescription mm-hmm. meds, I know that you are. I know that that's the age. Yeah. So whatever that could be, that could be a guy, if you are, if you have back spasms and have trouble sleeping, mm-hmm. let's use that as a silly mm-hmm. example, right? Uh, never have a poor night's sleep again. Um, uh, by by with this new, with this new chair, uh, I'm, I'm doing off, off the rep. Obviously, if you have <laughs> if you have back spasms and struggle with back pain, um, this is for you, right? So it's a, it's the benefit, it's the qualifier. Then I get into um, the actual like what life was what like before. So and this is a lot of user generated content. So I'll, oh, okay. I'll have like a senior talking and I'll say you know before I actually made the call, I didn't realize how much I was overpaying when I went to the doctor. My actual doctor that I loved wasn't even in network for me. And I get into the story and it put, puts them in like where they are right now. Like before I even clicked on the ad, like I was sitting there, I thought a lot of the stuff could be like scam. I actually mm-hmm. I thought people were just like, it, 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 it was too good to be true. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I put, put people in their pain at that point where they are today. So again, we, I, without taking up five more minutes that you get into the back pain where before I felt like this, it was da da da. And you want the person, you know, psychologically being like, that's me. Mm-hmm. Then I, I bring it back to life after. So again, it's, 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 well, if you have this, you could get this, the money, taking my family on vacation, Their outcome. doing this, da, 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 da. And I'm, I've got my call to action sprinkled in after. So I might, it might literally look get $1,700 back in your social security check. If you're over the age of 65, click this link now and call mm-hmm. the number and speak to someone within two minutes and they're going to help you. Before I called, blah, 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 before yeah. I felt this, after now I feel this. That's like in a, just in the simplest terms, like how I would structure a video creative for someone it's perfect because you have the hook you get their attention because everyone's scrolling that's yep. the fight the fight is attention but then you immediately if they don't fit your demographic want to get them off your ad because right. you're going to get charged more so you'd say if you're 65 and over they're like oh i am that person yes. they're not saying that out loud but thinking it yes. and then you want ugc of someone that demographic so they feel like they're looking in a mirror that's like right. this fits my demographic right, right. and then you're speaking to their pain points like oh this is actually the problem i have that's right and then you subject ta- tackle objections that, that's exactly right okay that's and, science and that's exactly right and a lot of those like even more tactically like a lot of people ignore like call it facebook ads or, or youtube uh, uh oh, sorry facebook comments or youtube comments stuff like that like that to me those are my objectives that mm-hmm. i have to overcome i love reading through those like i've got a, a, a relatively big organ organization and like i still read our facebook comments because i learned so much about steve win uh, founder of win hotels in yep. vegas um, would spend a disproportionate amount of time with the bellhop because they were the really? they were the first touch with the customers. So mm. He felt he could learn the most about his customer and how to create an unbelievable experience by talking to arguably one of the lowest paid people in his organization because they were the closest touch to the customer. Huh? That's interesting because their people are going to come into the hotel without any experience, and then they're going to have their own preconception of what this place is like, what the brand is like, and so they'd probably tell the bellhop, "Oh, I've heard this place is this," okay. without experiencing it. And you can take that. Yep. Just side note, that's how my YouTube titles, yeah. I'll read the podcast for like the first hour and they'll be like, wow, I learned so much about this thing. And I'm like, oh, title. and I'll change the title that's exactly like immediately. I love it. And so, so paying attention to that, if you're running Facebook ads or organically, you've got YouTube comments, like paying attention to those reservations because they're the, the customer demographics giving you the answers as to why they didn't buy something or why they didn't watch more, whatever it is. So really understanding those is super helpful in, in creating that. And then I can't stress enough, like people love to be told what to do. Yeah. Um, so the, the call to action is very important as well. Mm-hmm. So I find, I find a lot of times, um, you know, people go create an awesome ad or picture all this, and there's not a lot of direction. Click this link right now. Like our retargeting ads will literally even be, Hey, you saw our video. Why didn't you call? Mm. And they're like, pause. I'd be like, Call now. That's good. What are you doing? Yeah. And that's interesting. And it creates a little tension and it creates a little, but, but it's like very direct and it's telling them what's like, you need to call now. And it's, huh. and it's like, so you ask that question, why didn't you call? Yeah. Like, like you, you literally say, wow, yeah, that's cool. Pause that's clever. Like, call now. Cl- click the link. Mm-hmm. Why didn't you click it yet? You're still watching. <laughs> what, what do you mean? And then, you know, and, and we get it. Maybe it's because you feel like it's this. It's a scam. Mm-hmm. It's not. Mm-hmm. What it, maybe it's because you feel like it's too expensive. Blah, 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 right or whatever. Mm-hmm. Your subjection tackling in the ad. That's exactly right. Yeah, in the ad. And then, and then again, it, okay, so why aren't you click the link now? Yeah. Do it. And they're like, look for it now. You know, <laughs> as an example, so so those, those call to actions are, and it matters on your demographic, right? Like I'm talking to like seniors, so maybe not like. 
Well, they're probably struggling to find it, so you want to say it twice. You don't want them to get distracted. Or 100%. They, there needs to be one action that they can take. That's, no question. That's exactly right. And maybe like a biz op type thing. It's, yeah. It's a little, you can be a little bit more like, you're not trying to be a millionaire or what, what's the problem? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So talk to your demographic. That's but, so funny. But these, but it works though. Yeah. But these different, these different call to actions of telling someone what to do, I, I can't stress that how. Are you saying it like twice? Like go to taking the website name, then click the link below. Or are you only saying like, because people like different forms of call to actions. Like yeah. some people like to type in the domain. Some people like to click. Will you yeah. say multiple? I, I, I'm usually pointing, I, we're usually pointing to like what the end, end thing I want is like, okay. it. like okay. if it was like a uh, chair, I wouldn't be just like, click the link. I might, I might test click the link, but a lot of it's like, you need to like get this chair immediately. Like go buy the chair. They sense. have a 30 day money back guarantee. There's no risk to you. Mm. Buy the chair. Like I, I, you've got to be tired of having those back spasms. I know you, I was there before. Like I bought the chair. You need to buy the chair. So this is psychology, the priming exactly. of the call I'll to action. Prime them for what I actually want them to do. Mm. So I know I was saying click the link, but I'll prime. Like in my case, it's call, call, and there's a middle ground, right? Because that's where you get paid. And there's a middle ground, especially as an affiliate. There's a middle ground because I get paid on the call, but I need it to back into a tolerable acquisition tolerance. Yeah. My end partner, so hmm. I can throttle like click the link and call versus enroll. And, and yeah. there's, there's an ultimately a healthy, healthy middle ground somewhere in there. But you'll just test it. I'll test it, but there, there. So I would I would test the different levels because it's saying someone go buy the chair right now, the your clicks are gonna be more expensive and you arguably could have an overall lower cost per acquisition, but you want to test that against just check out the site go check out the site right mm. so you you'll test these everything and you might get fifty cent, um you know clicks through there your conversion rate slower but net net it's more profitable or maybe mm. it's more expensive so just testing those those higher intent versus lower intent call to actions I think I think. Watch the last 10 minutes like three times because that is more valuable than any ads course or equally as valuable and it's free on YouTube. <laughs> that was awesome. But just two quick things I had. Yeah. How do you find UGC for 65-year-olds? Dude, it's it's uh, you're actually going to laugh at this. Some of my best user-generated content is Craigslist. It's, <laughs> I, it's, actually, it's actually putting the right demographic of the problem. So like back to the chairs thing, I would put a Craigslist ad on there. Say, we're looking for a company spokesperson that has mm. severe back pain. That's it. So then my all my applicants come in and they have a lot of back pain. And so they're my actual real demographic with the problem. So for me, 65 is again, it'd be like, I, I'm looking for a 65 year old that um, has Medicare Advantage right now and pays at least $400 a month out of pocket. Like mm. as an example, like that's my, that's my actual customer. And so many times my UGC will actually like enroll in my product. Like they'll like, like they'll do the the spokes I'll call it a spokesperson video versus a UGC. It's a little bit little bit softer to mm -hmm. talk about. And they'll actually be like, after the filming, they'll be like, "Hey, like, can I actually call for the product?" And I'm like, "Yeah, dude, do it." And we'll literally film the call. Like, okay, go right there and, f and film it. And they'll literally actually enroll. I'm like, "Dude, no pressure if you don't want to." Like, <laughs> but they're like, excited "This is actually about better. It. Yeah. This is actually perfect for me." So I'll actually get my actual demographic. Mm. And then on top of that, back to the Facebook and YouTube comments. Some of my best UGC comes from having an outreach to those people. So someone who said that they called or someone that said they enrolled or for you, they I love this hour long video. Like I would hit those people up and be like, hey, would you ever do like a, a a quick testimonial video for me just on your cell phone? No big deal. Just like talking about like how much you loved it or why you watch my stuff or like just tell me about your life, like things like that. And I might have like a six minute UGC and I'll cut it. We'll cut it down to 30 second chunks of like actual usable content. Nice. But I give no direction. So it's very authentic. Good. It's my actual demographic, someone who enrolled or bought the chair in this analogy, and I, I'm reaching back out. And listen, you could offer a $20 Amazon gift card for them to do it. Yeah. So you could have incentives, but so many times someone actually liked the chair in this analogy. I don't have a chair. <laughs> but someone liked the chair, and if I'm like, hey, will you help other people that like had the back pain that mm -hmm. you don't anymore? And we just do like on your cell phone, just talking about like how you felt, where you're at. Like I give a little bit of guidance, but like, okay, what do you want me to say? Whatever, literally whatever. Just talk for as long as you want. And I get a five minute, uh, cell phone video back and some of that's my highest performing creative huh and are you using these like retargeting ads then no i use it for cold too I use too it for yeah of course. do you have like a formula that you've like tested like first ad how many retargeting ads yeah, yeah. or anything so like that it's um it's i'm gonna um put an asterisk on this because as an affiliate where you lose a lot is attribution so i really need to convert someone do you use Hyros? Have you ever heard of Hyros? I have not actually. No, what is it? You ever heard of Hyros? No. Oh, it's ad tracking. Okay. It's like th like a private company that's solely dedicated to ad tracking. Alex Great. Becker's company. That's awesome. Um, so a lot better of, attribution. So a lot of times, so, no, no, no. It, I'll, I'll I'll check it out for sure. Thanks for that. Um, but uh, and I'll be curious if if this works for this because if they did, they solve something really important. But if I'm 
I own chair company. You're my affiliate. You send someone to chair company's website. Like I, I don't get to pixel them and retarget them. At least in my experience, I haven't repixel them. Or in my case, someone called, they only spoke, mm. they spoke for two minutes. They didn't enroll. I, I don't get to retarget. You can't put a UTM link on top of a UTM link, a uh, tracking link. Is that what you're saying? Uh, so I can't cookie them based on them actually landing on the website uh, or what actions they took. Even better, I can't I can't retarget someone who added something to the cart. Gotcha. Like that. So maybe, I don't know for sure about that then. And, and maybe you can maybe you can retarget someone cold, but I'm guessing you can't retarget someone who like added to cart. I don't know. Yeah, That's yeah. It. But anyway, all that to be said, like in affiliate marketing, you really have to be uh, convert them cold. I actually, mm. so the retargeting traffic is off of like a three second plus. Oh, because you don't have access to add like a code in their header. Like, yeah. I yeah. can't add something to United Healthcare. Gotcha. So, but if they opt in, you could do it on your funnel. But okay, sure. So yeah. I had my funnel. Before, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It, which is which is a whole another topic we can get into. Makes sense. So overall, historically, where we've converted a high percentage of our stuff on cold traffic. If I own my own e-commerce company or something like that, that mm. would be a wildly different. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. It's still good insight for yeah. people. Okay, so then just last thing about the ad creative: is it a typically a video of like recorded video with their picture and then it's text on the screen, or is it like? slideshow style or you know um we test ran, everything we've ran but, and tested both yeah. um generically speaking especially if you're talking lead generation service um you're getting a much higher quality customer who's been through a video because okay. they've been um they've had to put a little more intent than just an image so if i had an image of a 65 year old holding cash like and they click through so a little bit lower intent than someone who's watched 45 seconds of a video right um so we run both, but generically speaking, video is going to be higher quality, which is good because, again, if your customer tells you they have a $600 acquisition tolerance and they're enrolling 10% of those, um, you know, you're getting paid 60 bucks per mm -hmm. versus if I'm enrolling 1% of those, my payout's much, much lower, which, again, I I'd always prefer to be the Rolls Royce or the Mercedes Benz versus the Toyota Camry. Not I used to have a Toyota Camry. So nothing <laughs> they mass produce a car at a yeah. lower cost versus a premium product handcrafted yeah i'd rather be getting i'd rather have so much more margin on a 60 dollar sale or phone call in my case than a 10 dollar call or something but can you break what were you saying 600 dollars? i was basically saying like let's say i put someone through and i'm just gonna use generics this isn't every time but a video campaign um let's say that quality is that one out of 10 people buy the chair at a 10 percent conversion rate I now getting paid, call it um, sixty dollars every website visitor in, in that silly scenario, versus the image I might have a one percent conversion rate, so I might get paid six dollars. So you're year. just breaking down the math, even though technically you still you get six hundred dollars. I get six hundred, okay. but I'm breaking down the math, and for me that's important because I if you're doing lead generation, you're that's paying per lead. E yeah. I'm getting paid per lead, but gotcha. it has to bake into the acquisition tolerance. Gotcha. So eventually, let's do call. Let's do that. So it takes ten phone calls to enroll someone. They're paying me six dollars a phone call. Versus if it takes, um, you know, what, one one percent or whatever it is, ten, uh, my, my mouse like a hundred phone calls. Let's say it takes a hundred phone calls. I'm only getting paid six dollars mm. phone call. Okay, sixty dollars per phone call. And I'd rather always play, have sixty dollars worth of margin to drive a phone call because I don't I don't think the image ad is driving customers at one tenth the cost, and they're enrolling at one tenth. The gotcha. That math. Yeah. So technically, you get only get paid whenever you sign up a person. But since you have all the data, you bake break it down to how many calls okay. is leading to someone who is a sale. So yes and no. So I'm, I'm generically speaking, getting paid every time I drive a lead. So a call, gotcha. but it, ha but I know that if they, if it's too low quality, they'll eventually drop my payout or yeah. turn me off. They'll gotcha. Say, hey dude, your shit's not. So working. it still matters. Gotcha. Yeah. So it still matters. So indirectly, it's just getting the cat differently. I'm getting paid every time they enroll someone and that's for any lead gen, including e-commerce. They're getting paid $50 a chair purchase. Mm. Still a lifetime value baked into yep. that. If the advertiser's the right partner, there's a lifetime value baked into that. So you mm. want to send them someone who's going to buy five chairs and also the pillow and also the mm -hmm. eye mask, I'm making shit up. They're going to buy all okay. that stuff because then they can pay you $80 of a chair purchase because they know that the lifetime value of your customers are really high. So it all bakes into that, in my opinion, the life tolerable acquisition costs of the lifetime value is really what you need to understand. By the way, getting to the advertiser, you need to understand what their lifetime value is and what their true tolerable acquisition costs. Can you break down what you mean by tolerable? Like tolerate what yeah. are, this is what they the expectation they're setting for you. Um, so if I've got a hundred dollar chair, and uh, let's say I own the chair company, and my um, employee salaries bakes works out to be it costs me ten dollars per chair for my employees, whatever it is. I've got a multi million dollar company, but I know. 
my my employees salary it cost me my my cost of goods sold is ten dollars for for the employees it's forty dollars for the actual raw material mm-hmm. now i'm down to 50 it's another ten dollars whatever okay or something like that so i've got forty dollars i can really put towards marketing where i can actually profitably acquire customers okay. i actually spent seventy dollars for that hundred dollar chair I'm upside down and I'm bleeding. I'm losing money because okay. I've got more costs other than just my marketing right. costs that go into my profitability. So, understanding what their true margin, gross is profit true. margin, yeah. understanding their their growth, yeah, their their profit margin is understanding where their margin is. And now, if you said, "Hey, what's your margin?" They're never going to tell you, right? But if I said things like tolerable acquisition costs, or if I said ah. lifetime value that this person's worth to you, okay, so you enroll them at fifty bucks a month. How long do they stay on? They stay on for ten months on average. Okay, <laughs> so they're worth five hundred bucks. They buy other. <laughs> in my head, I'm doing. Yeah, they yeah. buy other products, or is it just this? No, no, they buy another product. It's a one-time hundred dollars sale. So they don't know they're giving you the equation here. Yes, I'm getting six hundred <laughs> now. Uh, and and I might not do this in one sitting. Now, um, the actual cost, like like how much does a does a chair cost? Like on gen- like is that is it? It's got to be expensive. It's a nice chair, mm-hmm. dude. Like it's only like fifty bucks to produce the chair. Okay. God, I got ready, and I'm like getting the data, and maybe it's not exact, but you told me you could only afford fifty dollars for a chair. I just found out your lifetime value is six hundred dollars. The chair itself cost costs fifty bucks, so somewhere between fifty dollars and five hundred and fifty dollars, you can afford to pay me. So it's my job to push the push the limits on that, and a lot of that comes from again like like sales back to psychology. So now I'm saying, dude, we found this great pocket of customers that will take the upsell, and I think I can scale it, but the problem is it's costing me. Seventy dollars, seventy dollars every single time to acquire someone, and I'm upside down, and I I, I got to pause that campaign. So I don't know if are you guys in growth mode? Is that I don't I'm not trying to be greedy. Like is that is that a thing? You know, and no, okay, you know what? Let me ask my boss because we do want more. We do want more chair sales, and then the boss oh, approves the seventy. Okay, now I know that you can get up seventy. You know what I mean? So dude, that's, that's, that's how it kind of works out. So smart. I don't think you guys, if you're like a beginner, don't understand how genius that is, but that is why the relationship that he's building is so important because they're all going to tell you on the outside. And a lot of these lower level employees that you're working with just follow the rule book. That's given to them from their boss, but you know, there's flexibility. That's exactly. And so if you can build the relationship, start getting a little more piece of information, you get confidence on what you can ask for. Yes. And then if you're doing a good job, they're going to move the needle for you. And you nailed it. Like. I'm starting with a junior level account manager. Yeah. Who really doesn't give a shit. Right. For the most part, I don't see. He just gets paid. Man. Like you said at the beginning. They don't care. <laughs> yeah. They show up, they make whatever it is, 40 grand a year, and there's nothing, and that's not talking crap on anything about that, but, and they punch in and they don't care. Mm-hmm. Not all of them, but some. My job is to get to the middle manager, uh, senior manager, to the CMO, to the CEO. How fast can I actually have a monthly meeting with the CEO? That's mm-hmm. what I want to get. And that's my end goal for it. Even United Healthcare, a freaking multi-billion dollar Goliath, I want to become enough, enough of a partner with them that I actually speak to the CEO. Because then I can actually have a real strategic business conversation versus mm-hmm. I'm just given an Excel spreadsheet, I can pay 50 bucks a chair, that's really it. But when I make pushes and I talk in their language and also back to psychology, understanding how do they make money? Right. And again, I don't bluntly say, how do you get paid? Right. But, <laughs> yeah. hey, I got a question for you. My buddy's applying for a, a account manager job. Do you guys, um, like, do number sales matter for you? Or, like, what do you get, like, looked at? Because I want to make you look good. Like, right, however I can make you look good. Like, my job at the end of the day is to make you look good so that you guys can grow and we can right. create a partnership. And, oh, you know, I actually get judged based on chair sale, chair, number of chairs sold. <laughs> and I'm taking it. I got your back. I'm taking, yeah. I got it. So then I'm always able to talk in terms of them. Again, back back mm-hmm. to marketing. If we can, we can sell 1,000 chairs a day. Like is what I'm trying to get to you to 1,000 chairs. So now I'm talking in terms where they're now paying attention to what you're saying, but I have to understand what what you know with them, what's in it for them. You know what's. How happening. can you make them look good to their boss? Like that's exactly right. That's How it. Can I understand that? I can yeah. talk in terms of that. I can ha- have business strategic conversations around what looks good to them, and then listen. It's different at every level because the the actual senior senior managers will focus on margin or something like that. Mm-hmm. But this guy's focused on volume. I can if I can sell him on the vision of how much volume we can do together. I can get paid more. I can get better terms. I can learn more. They could even. I've even gotten big, five hundred million dollar companies to give me give me their customer list so I can run a lookalike campaign off their actual customer list. Like that's how integrated I have been with partners. That's smart. Who the hell has that strategic? Oh, yeah. I had tens of thousands of customers that I literally uploaded the Excel spreadsheet to Facebook, and I said one percent lookalike of these people. 
hello, where everyone else is running a demographic campaign based on people feeling blah, 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 right? So mm-hmm. that's a very rarity, but that's just, that's an extreme. But that is like the edge. That's an extreme. If you can get there. I get edges because now I know what they care about. I know, I know how I'm now getting in, roped into conversations with senior management because I'm making enough noise and, you know, all these mm-hmm. things. So th- this, me personally, you're asking me within my lead generation business, it sold, it was about six years old. The first year and a half, year to year and a half, I was intimately involved here. Last four and a half years, I was intimately involved here. Don't get me wrong. I still uh, focus on the strategy here, but I had really great uh, media buyers and I hired really great people to do this. Even at the size company where we were doing over a million customers a year for these big partners, I was still a point of contact for a lot of my partners. And it's not because I couldn't get myself out of the weeds. It's because this was the highest value activity. Very high leverage. This yeah. was the highest value activity for me to be focused on. Not that. Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and again, that's a naive statement for where where we are today. The beginning, I get it. That's mm-hmm. what you're focused on. I get it. But all I'm trying to say is it's, don't have your time allocation to be 99 and 1. Yeah, once you master this, you have hundreds of thousands of customers. You move this by ten dollars. That's an extra million dollars. And even at the beginning, though, dude, if you're if costing you sixty bucks to drive this chair company, if I can get paid seventy, automatically I'm off to the your ads are profitable. Getting paid fifty. Yeah. So again, let's use a seventy thirty split out of the gate. Seventy percent on your ads, thirty percent on this. That that's my ask. It's not what I, I'm being dramatic, and it's easy to watch this and be like, you know, that's the other thing that I think is interesting. Like we talk about like mentors, like where are people giving you advice from their current frame of the world, like. If, it, if you focus on what I'm doing today, it's actually not what serves you best from zero. You have to learn that skill. You can't skip this part. It's or crucial. advice is shit. It's actually bad advice <laughs> yeah. for how you go from, you know, from 25 million to 50 million to $100 million business is a much different activity than from zero to a million dollars right. in business. So the advice you're getting from this guy doesn't actually apply here at all. So, that, so to, to bring it back to like actual application processes from zero to a million in revenue, let's call it, you're zero to a hundred thousand, 70, 80% on ads, but 20, 30% on advertiser. Mm-hmm. And it's just far too often that it's 100% and zero or right. 99 and, and 1% here. And, and that, that's my, that's my ask for people listening is that that split. Right. For you, you really mastered this part. The, if you guys don't remember where we're going left and right here, this is like running ads, the actual marketing side. You kind of mastered that when you were running the traditional retainer based agency. Yep. And then once you got confident, like I can deliver results, you went to affiliate marketing so you can get results and then you focus on relationships so you can get higher margin. And that's where like the millions of dollars are made on the extremities when you have an edge. And that is how you get to the extremity basically by yep. focusing on that relationship and, my only thing and understanding that this only thing is that 20, 30% even from day one on the advertiser at that time was my, my customers paying me on my, my right. agency. I did always have a 20, 30, 40% allocation of time towards that mm. i just i just don't see I, I and again today might be 95 percent of my time allocation towards that but i just i don't see it in agencies i don't see like so much of the time allocation is how do i become better at running ads and media and i think that's awesome and i think that should be the majority but i did it should not be 100 percent of your time What's interesting is how we started this conversation about accountability for yourself and results for your customer yes. you're basically this is this person's job at the yep. company, at a huge company to like get more sales and to grow the affiliate marketing. You're basically doing their job for them at that point. That's right. That's really cool to think about it that way, to take accountability for their job, make them look good, and they'll give you everything. That's exactly right. That's really clever. Okay, so now that's the ad side <laughs> and, the, and the relationship side, which is probably the most valuable thing I've heard on this podcast for me personally right now. So thank you. Seriously, thank you. But moving into, let's say they click on your ad. Yeah. Are you sending them through a funnel or do you just straight up send them to a call page? You know, uh, so my funnel is, is a call page. Uh, so it basically like um, might be like a, excuse me, like a short, um, let me back up. Depending on the intent level of the ad is going to change the intent. I'm going to throttle and test the intent level on the landing page. Okay. So for instance, if I were to run a image of a senior holding up cash and they were to come and <laughs> all they see is a big phone number and says call here. Yeah. I'm going to get a lot of phone calls. They're going to be mm-hmm. horrible quality. It's going to be very bad for my advertiser. My my payouts are going to come down. They're going to turn me off. People are going to be confused. It's a bad consumer experience. On the inverse, if I said a video ad, that said you have to enroll here, and then you put them through a 100-question survey before I show them the phone number, people that call are probably going to enroll right away, but I'm going to get two people to do that. So I yeah. have no scale. I, it's not profitable. It doesn't make any sense to do. So... All that to be said is it fits somewhere in the middle. And right. that's what we'll throttle is essentially the intent of the individual along the funnel. 
So if they came in low intent, I may test a little bit more high intent of like, just say taking them through a 20 question or a 10 question um, questionnaire that maybe doesn't have anything to do. Are you a US citizen? Yes or no? Are you over the age of 65? Well, I know they are because that's what I targeted. Yes or no? But I'm actually having them add intent. Yeah. So they're getting more buy-in, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting more bought in. So um, so all that to be said is I'll throttle the intent on, on the pages. But be before I show a call to action, after I show a call to action, but I will say the common theme is I always have, and you're, you're the one who actually said it, the benefit statement. Like most of my marketing has nothing to do with the actual uh, X's and O's of what the product was. Like I remember we had a weight loss clinic um, customer. This is going back nine, 10 years ago. And the biggest headline was, it's not your fault. That was one of the best headlines I've ever written. It's not your fault. So people overweight us, it's not your fault. Why? Because I understood my demographic. I understood mm -hmm. where they were. Now, do I totally believe in that statement? Not really. Like, eh, you know, okay. Like, you, you could work out, eat healthy. You and I are in good shape. Like, there's a lot more to it. But I really empathize with my customer. And then I talked a lot about the benefit statements on looking good, feeling healthy, energy, being able to pick up their kids, being they, being when they're older, have, being active, all these mm -hmm. things that I, that, right, I'm just, I'm just kind of spitting stuff on the benefit. But I never talked about you're going to go meet with the doctor first and he's going to sit you down and they're going to do a nutrition plan and it's the best doctor. He's going to do a great nutrition plan with you and it's going to break down your macros. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you're going to get a lesson plan on how to work out and you're going to go three times. Sounds like homework. <laughs> I've never really talked about the actual products very right. much. Like even the chair example, if you gave, like, or that I gave, I, I might sprinkle in some stuff. It's this, it's this special, that, 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 but I'm not really, I'm not like there's a thousand count fiber on the chair. I'm talking about why the hell you want the chair. Right. You know? look cool, you want to feel good, whatever those things are. So I will say throughout my, you're talking about my actual landing pages and funnels, I'm very heavily answering reservations, like we mentioned. So I'm, I'm getting in their head before they they even say, like, mm -hmm. oh, this feels expensive. Like I'm already hitting that reservation dead mm -hmm. on at that point. And then I'm talking all about the different benefits. And if I'm doing it really well, I've targeted my messaging and my messaging is congruent with the different benefits st statements. So the guy who's got back pain got targeted because he had back pain. So saw the ad only because I, I demographically targeted him on back pain. My ad talked about back pain. My landing page talked about back pain. He bought because of back pain. I didn't buy because it had gold plates. On right. It. Whereas the guy who's maybe, let's call it the ego. I'm just being funny. The ego, <laughs> you know, I've targeted, I've talked about, and my landing page is congruent with that. So that's when I've gotten really good is when I'm saying, are you a... Uh, a mid 20 year old in the Arizona that runs a great YouTube channel and mm -hmm. podcast. That's really it. <laughs> like, you're like, that's freaking me. You know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Like that's when I've done really good is when I've yeah. marketed my marketing messaging to my different. Mm -hmm. That was probably the biggest revelation for me. My beginning days, like I had a client that was like a beauty salon. They did nails, lip injections, liposuction, all this stuff. And they're just trying to send traffic to a website where it's all of it. Like you just need to run an ad of people who want lip injections to a landing page, offering lip injections, exactly. to scheduling an offer for lip injections. That's the easiest way to do it or the best way to do it. So I had a question regarding your, I guess, pre-qualification process. If you guys didn't understand what he was doing with the questionnaire is you're trying to get people to put enough skin in the game or enough effort in where the only people willing to go through that really have the problem. And then once they've done that work, they feel like kind of obligated to even show up to the call or to actually call sure. and they're more qualified in a way. Yeah. So you're trying to find a balance. You don't want to do a hundred questions because that's too much work, but you don't want to do no questions because then yes. it's people who want like lazy solutions. Okay. So is are your landing pages, are you, first off, what are you using to build landing pages yeah. and is that type form for your applications or what are you doing? No, I, I, this, I, actually a lot of our stuff's cus, custom built, but there's so many off, off the shelf. Really? So you can, that you can. You're landing, like you have like a WordPress developer? A PHP, WordPress, yeah. So it's built on, mm. on WordPress. And exactly. It's all, it's all custom, custom hmm. at this point, but uh, mostly that's for flexibility. And listen, there, there's some, uh, unbelievable products out there that um, may even be cheaper or simpler or anything like that. We've, I've just, we've, we've always built it custom just for the flexibility. So you're having videos made by a team yes. that you're hiring and then you're building the website's custom. Correct. And then you're just using traditional like Google pixels or Facebook pixels That's to exactly track. Right. Okay, That's exactly cool. right. And I'm buying media within the actual ad platform. Yeah. I know there's third party. Yeah. Buyers. It's complicated. But um, and, and they might they might be great. But the, from for our business, that that that's how we, we we run it. And I was gonna make another comment. Oh, I was gonna say a really good place to look is not your like the most competitive industries. Like I love looking at like DUI attorneys, like shit like that. That like some of the best. I go where the best marketers flock. I don't necessarily run ads there. I'm not like I do. I compete with the best of the best. I'm not trying to be a cool guy. I'm but like they've got some really good shit. That's where you're learning from. I'm learning a lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm learning a lot from not even my industry. I'm learning from other industries. Mm. And back to you were talking about the intent. Like, 
dude, one of the best exercises you could do is go try and buy a car. Those guys have mastered hmm. what you're talking about as far as the intent. You walk in there and you go, how much is this car? If he's a good salesperson, he goes, well, hold. What are you looking for? Tell me mm -hmm. about you, right? And you're there for fucking six hours. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, you're like, screw it. I'll pay anything. <laughs> yeah, it's right? Like, like, like a two-hour webinar. <laughs> that's that's dramatic, right? And, and listen, it's it's less because you're there in person mm -hmm. versus like, you know, and you can hit an X. So there's a balance. But but um, that that's an awesome, annoying sales process mm -hmm. to go through just to understand what we were talking about as far as intent. No, 100%. I walked in a lot and said, how much for that Mercedes? And he said, 50 grand. I go, nah. Walked the other way. But if I drove it? Got seat massagers. Yeah, I did the whole thing. Right, and I went through it. And then you broke it down, then it's 50. I'm like, all right, yeah, okay, maybe. You know, but with maybe, financing, you only need 5,000 down yes. a day. <laughs> and, and don't take that so literally because I don't think you put someone through a two-hour webinar or I'm not the 100. No, I know. I know. Question, question, but ju just just to plant the seed as far as intent is, in, is important. And split testing and throttling. I don't think I've ever heard anyone split testing and throttling like intent across the funnel. Mm. That, that's really important to throttle that and split test that based on how low of intent and how high of intent, which mm. economics will work best for your advertiser mm. and your ad agent. And dude, I'm sorry, I forgot the actual question. I went back. That was a better answer. Oh. That's all I, that's all I know. Okay. But more so than what's just, I guess, the last question on this website. So you're doing questionnaires. Do you, have you ever tested like a, a short webinar, a VSL, any sort like videos, on, like you know, your trust building, your authority building? Years ago, we, ran, we were doing an info product and we did, we did a webinar and uh, admittedly, I, I think we had less than a hundred grand spend. So I, I, mm. I'm, there's far better people to ask for that. Okay, cool. I, yeah, I guess insurance isn't doesn't make as much sense. Everyone kind of understands what it is. You don't have to teach them that and much. It, and it could, could it could potentially. Um, we we haven't tested. But just a straight up, like once they get on the landing page, they have to opt in. Like, do they put their email in first, and then they get the questionnaire? So, um, and, and I use that as an example. So we've we've ran really long form advertorials for sure, which is like a, an advert advertorial. What, I've never heard of that. It's a um, think of it like a. Um, you're reading like a newspaper article type kind of thing. So we'll talk about. Uh, oh, is this, is this long for advert? Yes. Okay. okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. But go ahead and explain advert. it. Yeah, yeah. So it's long form. So essentially there's a lot of text copy on it. So you'd send someone from a uh, Facebook ad to your landing page. 10,000 characters. Right. And, and there, there's a middle ground to there too, right? Where it could feel like a normal like Yahoo Finance article or something right. where it's maybe got, you know, uh, 2,000 characters or, or whatever, whatever it is on it. But it's really all tax, and it could be written as a third party. So you could be a third party endorsing the chair. It could mm. be a, a first party. It could be a, a customer's review about the chair, and it's and it's long form. So that you're really going through like, like all the sales psychology, like testimonial, exactly. social proof, all of it. And a lot of it's exactly what we talked about it. Yeah. In text copy, we'll, yeah. we'll do that. We we'll split test that. You split test with like yes no questions. So are you this? Are you this? Are you that? And honestly, for us, because we're into and, and goals to drive a phone call. Um, a lot of it is that the call to action is just the phone. Okay. Like immediately. Call this phone number. And, and and that works. People will actually call the number right off there. And I didn't even actually capture So no email drift campaigns needed, just straight up. And and I would say on that too, a lot of times like, um, and this is a bi uh, bias comment because I'm so used to like, I call it telephony phone calls and stuff yeah. like that. But um, I would re I actually get to interview Gary V, which was really yeah, it was super cool. Oh, cool. Super, cool. And one of the things he made a huge case to was, and not saying ditch email, but he's like, dude, text message marketing. Yeah, SMS right now is big. Shit. And I sent a text the next week. My team took maybe twenty minutes to load up. We texted all of our old customers. I think we literally made one hundred seventy five thousand dollars in the first hour. And like an hour, just like literally like one text, no sequence. Because they can just call. Twilio. It's on their phone. Yeah, Twilio. And I literally just went, you know, we just hit it. We sent, it was like one sentence and called the number. And it was like, it like freaking made so much money. So so we started ca capturing more phone numbers and text messaging mm -hmm. and, and uh, essentially putting them through a sequence and stuff like that. But I would, I would, uh, I would, I would touch on if someone's like putting a lot of effort again towards email, like just like a poke is like text messages. I think there's like a. 90 plus percent open rate. I don't know about you. I've opened every text I've ever got. Oh, yeah. 90 plus. Just to get it off my. 100%. Yeah. 90 percent open rate, which is not even close to email. And then the response rate, I think. I don't, I'm making up numbers. You can fact check me. I think it's like, at least for us, we had like a 10% mm. all in rate, which is like. It's really good. That's email, a good click through rate, it's like 3%. Yeah. And the open rate is only 40. So it's insane. I just want to add context here for everyone listening. There, in marketing, there's so much nuance. You have to understand your demographic. And so the reason I asked about VSLs or videos, because I'm maybe more in the info product world, and then but he has an older demographic in this example, and those older people may like to read because they're used to reading the newspaper, and so that's native to them. That's right. And then they prefer to call, and so SMS is better than email. Yep. And so you have to be intentional 
with those choices. Is it email? Is it text? Is it both? Probably both, but whatever. Like you have to really think through your target demographic and what's natural to them. You know, I'll say you were, you were talking about like um, kind of edges or like what other people aren't doing and and, um, and you're like, don't toot your own horn. But um, I like, it. there's a term called method actor. I don't know if you've ever heard of mm-hmm. this, but it's basically like, like um, uh, what's his name? We played the Joker. Heath Ledger, like actually, mm. I think actually like committed suicide because he was so playing his role yeah. so much. He drove himself actually crazy. Like, I always joke, I'm like, I'm a method actor when it comes to this stuff. Huh. So like we ran something in uh, people getting out of credit card debt and I actually like defaulted on bills to understand what it felt like to be a consumer in credit card debt. <laughs> and like, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. Like my credit score got hit and all the, all this stuff. But like, and this is, this is like, years and years ago. Like, in, like you could have paid it, but you just chose yeah, to go. You just wanted to go through the process. I wanted to feel how it felt like to be my consumer who I was talking to, who was. Oh my on God. And like even now, we'll go back to the senior demographic. Like I volunteer in like group homes, assisted living homes, retirement homes. I spend a lot of time on my demographic, a lot of time, because that's the only way I think I could actually understand these people. Uh, uh, in any demographic, even if I, I guess if I'm not my own demographic, is a good way to say it. But like, right. like that's the only way I can really, really, re- like uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I didn't understand like people in in debt, credit card debt, are very re- if excuse me. I grew up Catholic. I'm very re- religious, and I didn't put two and two together. It's actually there's a lot of biblical around you're a slave to your creditors and and uh, or mm-hmm. don't be a slave to your creditor. Right. How bad debt is for you. Right. I would have never thought of that being a, a religious angle. I partnered with one of the largest mega churches and ran ads to their congregation, and it converted like wildfire mm. because because that demographic was so ashamed, maybe uh, or just uh, as maybe built in a little bit more into their psyche. Aware, to, yeah. to not be in debt. All that to be said, fun and fun, cool, cute analogy. Uh, that's or a real life example. But point being is like, I only got that spending. A l- I actually would literally call my customers and say, and th- this is now at this point, like running tens of millions of dollars business. I still get on the phone with my customers and say, hey, just conducting a quick survey. You mind if I have a few minutes with you? Back to the Steve Wynn example. I stole that play- page out of his playbook, and this lady kept saying, "Thank God." God, thank God, I prayed, thank God, God. Thank... And it just got me curious and I was interested. And I only had that insight because I took the time to spend time with my demographic. If you're not calling back your customers, even if you're an affiliate, calling them, messaging them on Facebook, if you're not going to the retirement home, spending time with a senior or whatever that is, you you could n- you, you will never, ever have the creative awareness to actually talk in their language. Back to the chair example that I just gave. That was so damn insightful for me. Like you just shifted my mind completely. I'm so glad you live in Arizona, dude. Hell yeah. That, anyone listening to this, you have to understand like these are million he's running a millions, millions of dollars worth of a company. And this is the level of depth you have that he's going to to hit that, absorb that, internalize it, and action that. Because it's not as simple as clicking only on ClickBank, throwing up a click quick click funnel, and then doing that if you want to go this far with your business. And so that level of, I call it psychopathic intention, <laughs> is what it takes to be a top performing person. So that's awesome, dude. Really appreciate you sharing that on here. And that's completely free, my guy. What a nice guy. But okay, I totally forgot the train of thought because that was like, I was fully in that moment. I'm sorry, <laughs> but that was really cool. Okay, so, okay, here we go. Your company was doing millions of dollars of revenue. Yes. So what, this is just for me, because I'm kind of like on yeah. that level and I'm wanting to scale to where you went. So- what size was your team and like how did you kind of like organize yeah departments in a way it's actually a really really lean team so we had uh um caught um uh, we had 16 full-time employees at scale and called another 10 to 12 off the bench if you will so was this in arizona sorry contractors uh half the team was in arizona okay say about how i'm using round numbers but uh the core team was in arizona so I love the idea of remote work, like we talked yep. about too. Um, I have a thesis that if someone's like a, for me, like a senior level or like a core individual, I should want to like see, feel, hear, touch them. Like I want right. to be close enough where we could go over dinner and kind of like creative, accidental yeah. insight. Right. Accidental That's a good way to put it. So um, um, currently and pretty quickly, like anyone who was of um, a high level strategic value is local to me. Um, and, and I like that and I prefer that. That's not always necessarily like uh, tangible if you're just getting started out, but that, that to me is a holy grail. And 
listen, I, we don't have an, we haven't had an office since 2019. Mm-hmm. So I'm not even, we go to a coffee shop right. probably Monday through Thursday. I bet I see them for three or four hours a, d- yeah. uh, a day. So 16 hours a You're week. Like, just best hours of the day, essentially. You know, what, yeah. Like that's enough for me. Right. I'm, um, so I'm not tied down. They're not tied down. We still work remote. Everyone gets the job done. To answer your question, I had a, um, tell you the beginning and then today. So uh, beginning, I had myself, I was doing everything. Like I'm sure a lot of people listening, yeah. running the ads, talking to customers, doing everything. Um, quickest thing I hired for is, and this is me practicing what I preached. I hired a uh, junior media buyer. So some of this is in my affiliate business. Junior media buyer who could kind of watch under me and, and kind of like learn and and I'm a big proponent of show, then watch, then monitor. So I show mm-hmm. them how to do it over an extended period of time. Could be a month or whatever it is, a couple of weeks. Then I let them do and I watch very closely. So I'd let them launch a couple of campaigns for mm-hmm. a couple hundred bucks. Right. And I'd watch and we'd go back in and, I, and I'd, oh, we missed this. this. And, then mo- and then having at scale, you have a monitoring in place. So you have da- I get daily reports of how much revenue, profit, spend. We had things like that, our quality metrics that we're watching. So now I've got the KPIs that I'm watching. And I'm monitoring, but that's not all in a week. That's, you know, over time. So I had junior level. And um, what I started doing is the strategic elements of the ads and stuff. I would lay out and he would carry out the grunt work, carry out the grunt work until I filled him up. Then I got, then I I, I went from part-time from him to full-time. I brought him on. And as he got more literate, I would have him do more and more of the actual building out the campaigns. And I'd Mm. watch again too. And I'd kind of put the the structure and then get more and more strategic. So essentially if if you're noticing, I'm like, trying to be insanely aware of what the highest value activity I could be working on. And I'm trying to delegate from the lowest value. So bookkeeper, uh, assistant and bookkeeper were my first two hires. I, it was easy for me. I didn't like doing it. She was doing the shit that I, that me, I, me too, by the way. Exactly. And, and those were easy hires. What's mm-hmm. not is when you're a marketer and you love to run ads right. and you have to delegate. That's where I'm at. Yeah. That's where it was like, it was, it was, a, and it wasn't a challenge, anything other than psychologically. Mm-hmm. It was like getting things off my plate that I like to do, mm-hmm. but it wasn't the highest value activity. And I had a, uh, I think a revelation for me that might be helpful is, I think it's Warren Buffett spends like, and he has, it's not just because he's old, because you know, oh, he's old now. Spends like, I think he's like one meeting a day. And that's been for like decades where he just like stares at the wall and thinks. And I started blocking out time in my calendar to think. I put two hours of thinking time. Mm. And at first, you're kind of like, all right, what the fuck am I doing? And the next time you're, you're scrolling on Instagram, I'm like, okay, no phone next yeah, time, yeah. right? Like, all right. Phone's the killer. Yeah. Got that next time. Okay, okay, okay. Why? But, you know, and, and you get better at actually strategically putting time to think down. And I had a joke with my upper management team. It's not really a joke. I said, when we've gotten good is when you guys aren't doing anything mm-hmm. all day long. You're staring at a wall. Like, that was our end goal was for them to do nothing. And it was just to think. And it's like, huh, how interesting of that is that versus like trying to slave drive someone for 90 hours. A week. Right. And we still have to get our shit done. I'm being funny with that statement, but it's actually true. Like I want a lot. 100%. Of, a lot of my day, and you or anyone listening is an entrepreneur, the quicker you can get to, I had someone one time poke me really hard. I had, it was making a ton of money. I was doing great. I had a team. Yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> He's like, no, you're not. And I was like, yes, I am. He's like, no, you're not. I was like, what do you mean? It's like, you've built yourself a job. Mm-hmm. And what a fucking ego poke that was. Right. I'm no, I wasn't an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone who owns the business, works on the business, not in the mm-hmm. business, where you could go disappear for a month and the business grows. I was like, oh, shit. All right. I, I'm a good employee of myself. Mm-hmm. And it was like really like actually the, the, the labeling that I needed to get me to the next level it was like I'm not an entrepreneur mm-hmm. until I'm doing that. So anyway, so... No, it's really important. It's a perspective shift. People brag about, I work 80 hours a week. I'm like, that kind of shows that you're not doing a good job on your business. Exactly right. You, and, and you haven't delegated. Right. And it's unhealthy. And there's just, there's, there's so many things. But they think they're like cool for it. And I'm like, you're kind of telling the smart people you don't know what you're doing. And it's funny, you'll, you'll, um, you'll find my richest, smartest friends ask how many employees you have. And the last number I say, the bigger, pump, the flex. Uh, yeah. How big is your office? I don't have an office. Yeah, it's cool. You know, like, <laughs> Whereas, like, when I was coming up, you're like, I have 30 employees. Yeah, I'm the man, I'm dude. I've got a 50,000 square foot office, right? And that doesn't mean don't have employees. Right. right? That could sound cool. That was the old way of leverage. But in our modern age, you can. That's exactly right. right. That, that's what's cool. So anyway, so if I go back, it's uh, tactically speaking, I, I, how, I got, how I got out of that, because I think that's more beneficial than where I am today, actually. But I, I, let, me, let me break down your question in, like, two sentences. I hired for shit I didn't like to do. Right. That. Which assistant and bookkeeper. I didn't like it. Easy. 
Then I started hiring for, for things that I like to do, but I knew were not the highest value activity. How I arrived at that is I had a, this is so simplistic, I had a notebook next to me and I had an alarm go off every 15 minutes. And I would write what I did, what I was working on at that time. Mm. And I would write it, and I write it, and I write it, and it, like it, not just email, emailing who, reading what, doing what. And then at the end of the day, and I only did that for a couple of days, and I look back, and so much of my time is spent actually building out these campaigns or responding to emails or oh, I got distracted and I read for two uh, two hours on shit that I didn't need to be doing. And I, I got very tactical with my life, like very deliberate with my time. And it was only doing that like a monkey. Ding, 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 ding. What am I doing? <laughs> ding, 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 15 minutes later. And then I could start circling things that I knew I shouldn't have been doing. So that was very easy for, for me to have him start building out campaigns. I would set kind of the structure. I'd build out the structure. He'd actually go, go, these audiences with this, with this, with this. Then I got it to be more strategy. And I got it to where he could run ads by himself. And I would watch in. And I and I lowered my time less and less. Smart, smartly though. And, and I think another good... Um, Chef for people, as someone said, if you can hire someone eighty percent as good as you, that that that's that's the goal. That was helpful for me because no one's going to be as good as you, dude. You're the guy who's going to make all the money, be the entrepreneur. Right. You're the guy who's, who cares the most. You're the one working hundred hours at the beginning, putting up your money. Like no one is going to be as good as good as you. I shouldn't say no one. Probably not. Low. So for me, looking for people as good as me, I'd be like, I can do that better. No <laughs> shit, dude. No shit. So the second I stop saying I could do that better, say, but could he do it 80 percent as good as me? I go, I guess. Right, it was like, it, 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 it's your ego, right? Again, but, your body language on that. <laughs> I guess, right? But like that was the goal, and so it was a lot easier to to scale and to pull myself out of the day to day because that was the goal. So it was a lot easier to frame it that way, and then I was able to delegate more and more and more, and and until eventually where, uh, again, I was still helping on the strategy here, still watching, but. Maybe at that point, 50% of my time was on the advertisers and spending time over there. And then that continued to shift and shift and shift. One, I like doing this. Two, I'm good at this. Is that be classified as sales in a way? Oh, sales. Sales, yeah. And I think that's always the highest value. Okay. So that's, by the way, that 80% rule that you just said, is the 80%. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Um, but so you have a media buyer that you're training up. He yeah. might be 80% as good as you. That's yeah. great. Do you have do you ever have like a project manager to like oversee like accounts or account managers? You know, um, now I I do. Um, like where they're fa- for like facing the client client facing. Oh yes, client facing. Yes, yeah. So I, one guy client facing. It was it was me. So first I was doing everything. Then he was doing some of this, and I was still doing this because I because I still believe this is the highest value. Yeah. And, and 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 this was the hardest to hire for, and I think the highest value again. Even the agency. Let's go back to even more simplistic business, like. I had someone running ads again, and I was the client face facing, and I tried to get someone in there to to um, uh, manage clients, and they would do a pretty good job. But even then, like I, I I was like the higher payers, like I still managed towards the end because I knew mm-hmm. I, that was the hardest position for me to hire because it's a very high value individual. Could they do the job well without understanding the media buying side to the That's core? Question: I've never had someone who didn't understand both. Okay. Uh, and I wouldn't say intimately, but a, not the language because he moved from junior to or junior to middle to client manager because he could talk very well. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, this guy at my current co- company was uh, ran Google AdWords for maybe six months, seven months. So he un- understands it enough. So I, I would say for me, um, they both understand it pretty well. Okay, cool. So again, this is a, is there any other core hires that you'd say that like you were surprised that was so important or that pretty much, it's pretty straightforward, I'd say. I would say a fractional CFO. A f- is fraction, that, what, is, what do you mean by fractional? Fractional mean an hour or two a month. So there's yeah, something yeah. called okay. B2B. It's a literally letter B2B CFO. And these are a lot of like retired CFOs from big companies that charge a lot, maybe three, 400 bucks an hour, but three, three or four hours a month. And I didn't really understand the value to reading my p l similar to how you read an ad account as an example mm. or something like that and there's a huge value because i could really understand where there were bleeds in my business profit centers um, there are a lot of things that i started tracking that i didn't track before that i didn't mm. understand and um it was very inexpensive for the value yeah. that the individual brought because they have 50 years of skill and they can look at it like that and it takes an hour or two yeah um mm. a month and that's all we would meet with at first and a forecast. I didn't realize 
Really? No different than goal setting. So if if, <laughs> yeah, if you're going through life and we're like, yeah, da, 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 but if you said, hey, I saw your video on this. this show, oh, thanks. Yeah. If you were like, uh, he yeah. has a YouTube channel. Go watch his YouTube channel. <laughs> thanks, dude. Uh, yeah, if you want to, if you know, if you want to set a goal to lose ten pounds, mm-hmm. twelve pounds. I like this one. Let's say twelve, and it's a it's a pound a month or something like that. Um, you know, you you've got. Did I lose that pound this month? No, I better sure shit lose two next. First, I want to lose weight. It's for generic comment mm-hmm. or whatever that is, right? You can even break that down even more bite size. But a forecast does the same thing. I, we want to be at this level, which means I need to do this per month, this per day, which means I need to have costs at this and revenue at this. Mm. Like it's very, I actually had it down per hour. I knew my, oh my God. Per hour that I needed to drive to go hit my one year goal. And that forecast was extremely helpful, put together relatively inexpensively, but I would have hired a CFO faster. Okay. These are like year five for most people if you're watching this, but really important for scale and to like do real numbers. And I say CFO actually, um, probably year one. I would have really, one yeah. Hmm. I, I need a CFO. <laughs> I, I would have one at year at year one. Certainly, I mean, we talked about your level. I, absolutely, yeah. Level, I would have one. I probably had a CFO, uh, uh, part for actual CFO at. I was making call it 150 thousand profit. Revenue was probably 250, so about a quarter mm. million. Where I had a, over a hundred thousand okay. dollars of call it money to myself mm-hmm. it was a lot easier to justify call it two to three grand five grand for the year let's say of a fractional cfo okay i think this money will spend great advice thank you okay i'm gonna ask a selfish question now yeah. kind of a left turn though do you know, have you ever heard of sub affiliates sub affiliates or affiliate tree where essentially you would let people like you would build out that exact you'd give them the ad give them the funnel and you're basically just hiring media buyers and you get a fraction you just like split the revenue so they could do Got it. more at scale if you're like Say you have like a twenty dollar profit margin per lead, yep. you'd give them ten, and you know that you have all the data. Brokering, you're like yeah. a network. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So a network. Is that the term? Uh, yes. That that's what I would call it. But sub affiliate might be the correct. In your you're more experienced than me. I don't know. No, no, no. <laughs> but, but you also have like econ. And, and okay. Yeah. So you might be correct. In, in your but you never tried that. I never brokered people's traffic because okay. I wanted to control it on my end. Here's the problem with it's like hiring an affiliate, an affiliate hiring an affiliate basically. For me, we'll use. Network, you call it sub affiliates. So sub affiliates are network. Problem is like what I just described was like, I want to get the fuck away from them as quick as possible because they eat up margin and I don't think they add a ton of value and I want mm. directly to the end offer. So for me, I was never the network because even if I got something off of scale with a sub affiliate. You guys are competing term, for traffic when it's paid almost too. Um, it's just like, let, let's let's say you're my, let's say um, uh, Jeff is the chair owner. I'm the affiliate. You're my sub affiliate. Jeff pays me fifty. I pay you thirty. You we start cranking. You start crushing sales. Like, how long do you want to pay my twenty percent toll tax? When you want to talk to Jeff immediately. Okay, so we briefly touched on the tools you use, like using Facebook ads and then building on WordPress and all that. But were there any other like communication tools? You said Twilio for SMS, but anything internally that you used that helped? Yeah, Slack, um, email, of course. Um, you know, I think this isn't necessarily tools, but um, we would have, uh, especially with the virtual team, Monday morning meetings we have every morning, or every Monday, excuse me, where it's just a touch base, the entire team, um, no matter what the size was on there. Uh, I, I really like that that cadence of communication. Um, some other cool tools just in general are um, something called Boomerang on Gmail. Basically, you can schedule emails out. Um mm. and, and like if then response as well. So that's just a. Good oh, so you didn't even need like a auto responder, like an active campaign or anything. Just yeah, boomerang mm. Gmail. Or, I guess that's more like when I was managing. Um, when we had the ad agency, like uh, I'd, I'd like schedule something out to go out at like Saturday night at like 11 p.m. Mm. So that my customer thought I was like freaking busted. <laughs> right? like, like for your clients, yeah. yeah. Or or if I want to remind, it's it's a cool <laughs> it's a cool tool tool. Look 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 at that. I'm trying to think of it. Twilio. Anything text message, auto auto callback is all built on top of Twilio. Even if you go to like um, another company, they uh, are they, a lot of these companies are built on top of Twilio. So, um, but I, what, what I would do um, more importantly, and I've been doing this a lot with like AI stuff, is pay attention to like inefficiencies in your day or your business, and uh, do a Google search. I know that sounds so funny. Uh, like, uh, okay, like uh, the chair stuff. Like, okay, I want to know how to get testimonial videos better. Like, and I just start Googling around. Like, maybe set like an hour on a Sunday to, mm. to like for random research stuff. I'll find some really badass tools. Really badass tools for, for stuff like that. Like AI based? Yeah, just AI. You're speaking my language. Yeah. Like AI, yeah. For me, it's like AI based. Like, at one point, I was like, 
I wonder if I could find something like some of YouTube videos, right? And they right. was like when at first like Chat GTP was getting like uh, GPT, excuse me, was getting um uh was getting a, a little bit more main, mainstream. I was like, I wonder if there's anything that'll sum up the the YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And I was literally at one point like took the transcription from the video and then copy and paste it in there, and I'd get like a download. I'd be like, mm -hmm. oh sweet, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And like uh, so obviously that now there's like an extension and stuff like that. Oh yeah. But the point of me saying that was like, where is there like inefficiencies on like an Andrew Huberman three hour podcast? Right. So I'm like, I'm not, or Joe Rogan, I'm like, I'm not going to listen to that for three hours, but can I get the distilled best pieces and things like that? So I'm going on a really weird tangent. That does, This is important though, especially with AI, because sure. these are going to be edges that we talk about. 15 sure. minutes a day is a big deal. So every t tool will have an AI tool, essentially. So I, I would spend a lot of time, um, um, and my belief is the benefit of AI, AI will be the uh the data that the model's built on yep number one and then two the ability for us to dream up how to use and leverage it. i think it's a commodity the act it's an unbelievably powerful tool cool com commodity mm -hmm. but i don't think anyone listening even if you're a plumber needs to learn how to build ai i, mm -hmm. think, I think you you need to be thinking about what how does it work and where where could it be applied to inefficiencies in my life and that's maybe a little bit more like uh modern day present day example that's helpful for people but even like in general business, where's what else is there inefficiency in my day? And mm -hmm. then I go seek out tools for it that, that right. I go plan. I got VA, like th these will basically replace VAs very soon, that level first. So really important for people to be aware of. I have a ton of videos on my channel. But uh, what about like a CRM? Like do you use like Notion? Do you say Monday.com or do you say Monday meetings? Monday morning meetings. Okay. I use Monday.com um, as well too. CRM for actual customers. See, we never were like back to the Rolls Royce, like the max customers I ever had. At the agency was 25, maybe 30 mm -hmm. ops. And then at the lead gen business that was acquired like 16. So I, I never like, I, had, I used, um, I think it's like pipes, if I'm not mistaken, okay. ops, pipes.ai or something like that. Okay. Oh, cool. For, uh, for, uh, for, ma for managing like, um, like, like lead, lead flow, things like that. But okay. admittedly, I didn't have like a hundred person, um, uh, which I'm gonna call it like, uh, like a uh, customer list that I was, yeah. Getting. And I was okay. targeting like a few big carriers, cool. carriers, carriers. Yeah, I guess you didn't really collect emails even that much for your no, leads. No, but back to your, um, I we use, and it might be too specific for my space, but Leadspedia okay. uh, was the name of the software for like uh, CRM for leads. Excuse me, you're correct. Twilio, I believe, don't quote me on this, this is a little too in the weeds for, for me right now, but I think Twilio also has a CRM on phone numbers and text okay. message. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that's what we use. Yeah, I don't know. Um, then I had one other one I was going to share with you, but I can't I think about it. Up. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so... Now I want to transition to what you're doing now because it's cool as shit to me. <laughs> like you're like literally like living like the dream in a way. Thank you. But basically he's made enough money where he doesn't ever have to technically work again, I'd say. That's safe to say. And so now you picked up a complete new skill and you just DJed at EDC yeah. as like a DJ on like the main stage, which is so cool to me. Yeah. And I did watch a little bit of another podcast and it seemed like it wasn't necessarily something that you were always, like this wasn't like in the plan no. from like, I'm going to, I want to be a DJ, but to yeah. be a DJ, I need to master affiliate marketing, get financial freedom. Then I can chase yeah. my dream. It was more so like, this sounds, I'm, I sold my business. This kind of sounds interesting and I don't know anything about it. Yeah. So tell me about that journey. Cause that's so cool. Uh, dude. Yeah, dude. Thank you. Uh, so this, this will get a little more. So, for, so first, um, interesting thing is right when, uh, my business was acquired, um, I had a new business, which was managing my finances. So I, I had to, and I think anyone who's making, you know, relatively significant money, I don't think you need to have like a massive liquidity event. I think that I ignored that being in my second business for too too long because it's, mm. it's uh, arguably even a more important business depending on how much money you've made because you already have the cash versus right. trying to go make more cash, right. if that makes sense on it. So um, I, I did what I always hire a mentor. We talked about that right away. I love peer-to-peer -peer learning groups. So I joined a group called like Tiger 21 before that. Oh, really? That's cool. You're in Tiger 21? Oh, you know it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, I yeah, am. I love it. Huh. I love that group. So I was in, uh, when my business was under 250K in revenue, I was in EO, uh, EO Accelerator, uh, Entrepreneur Organization Accelerator. I would recommend that for business even 5 million mm. below, but it's really the 250K and up is the, is the excuse me, 250K to a million is the size business. Then a million plus is called EO, then 13 million plus called YPO. And then after a certain amount of assets, you're able to- it's an Did investment. you join YPO? Yeah, I was in YPO as well. Oh, shit. I want to talk to you about that. Okay, cool. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. But don't, but I, I, that's, I've been doing that for 12 years, these peer-to-peer, -peer, even Tony Robbins Platinum Partner Group, like these peer-to-peer -peer learning groups, I think are really important for mm. me. So I, I just wanted to note that. But um, 
through uh through as being like a transition for that or like something that i like uh, was navigating uh, yeah last year um so that that's one and then you mentioned the the djing stuff i i have a maybe a what did you call it psychotically it's like Psych- psychotically intentional psychotically intentional i like i like that it's kind of a very very triggering word i have to like <laughs> it um but i i had this like um i believe this like exists for everyone whether you're i don't know if you have to be religious or philosophical or in a karma or what, what it doesn't matter whatever mm-hmm. it is but like Anyone who's ever like visualized like a free throw before, you know, before you, you know, yeah. and then you have a higher chance of making it. Like feel it going in the, right? yeah. yeah I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, like, like, you know, it, it, and so um, I just had this like thought, like um, maybe like two years ago, I was like, okay, if it's, tr- I believe m- most people delusionalize worst case scenarios. So I believe we make up completely the worst case scenario of, off of fear. Not everyone, but- uh, It's our human instinct, you know, like a survival thing. Yeah, I heard survival. But if most of that shit's made up, and if you reflect back and you ah, this and this and that, none of that hap- less than one percent of that ever happens. Right. Certainly less than ten percent. Let's go. You're let's making yourself miserable that. in your mind. So why not be unbelievably delusional on what could happen positively? So like even like like today, like I, it doesn't, it's not you know people meditation. I woke up for five minutes and I delusionalized like the best day ever. I had like a delu- oh. and it's just like so out there yeah. and insane. And it could be that there was a crowd of ten thousand people in your office when I'm talking, and <laughs> they were all business owners. And they all went on to employ <laughs> yeah. ten thousand people each, and the the magnitude of impact was growth so much, and all the families that I'm, and I just like I'm going down a rabbit hole, just like unbelievable, delusionally made up shit, which sounds funny, but we do it all day mm. long on the negative. So why not do it positively? So. I like thinking about, I did it a year or two ago. I said, what's something that's just like out there that I could do? And I was like, I want to meet Les Brown. I don't know if you know Les Brown is, but he's a- he's a Football coach? No, that's Les Miles. No, 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 it's okay. Les Brown's like um, our grandparents or parents like Tony Robbins. Like, okay, okay. So he's like a motivational speaker. He's unbelievable. And I'm a big, big fan of his work. And I was like, I want to meet him. Um, so then I, I just put it in motion. I started you know, hiring someone who would know someone who did something at uh, someone who's been in touch with him before, I started reaching, getting resourceful, my network, all this stuff. So, Bill, next thing you know, I'm I'm interviewing him in a podcast. That I started a podcast just because I wanted to. <laughs> there you I, go. It was like totally intentional. Yeah, intentional. But yeah. I don't know. A podcast. I was like, yeah. I got a podcast. Can I interview you? Oh, and by the way, you know, so I, and I got to fly out and meet him in Atlanta. So I was like, okay. So if anyone listening comes with the basis that if you believe that you can be or do whatever you want, and I do believe that anyone at any level can be or do whatever we want. And I also believe that if you were born in the United States of America, 100%. you are overly, overly in the 1% of mm-hmm. the, I don't care if you make minimum wage working at McDonald's, you're in the 1%. I, I truly believe that. You were gifted by God, grace, whatever whatever you want to put it, to, to, to be here. You are unbelievably at a advantage mm-hmm. being born in this day and age and, and where you're born. And do you have the internet? Y- 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 time, everyone's, everyone's equal on that, so that, that you can't say I don't have enough time. Everyone has the same amount of time. Internet now has broken down any barriers of, of knowledge, so you can't say I don't know. I don't know. You could know. You could figure it out. So there, there's there's no barriers to get to, to, to where you were, to where you want to go. So anyway, all that being said, I, I had that, that thought and I was just at a music festival and I, and I really love it. Listen, I've never done a drug in my life. I, I, I drink once in a while, so it's not. Why not? You haven't done LSD or anything? I'm not. Shrooms, dude. Oh. I, I, I haven't cut off that I, I potentially one day would, would look at like ayahuasca or mushrooms or something. I know there's a lot of data around it and I have no judgment around any, any or anything around that. I, I've literally never done a drug in my life. Um, but I love EDM music festivals. I don't know. Mm. I just love the energy. I just love love. It's just like a good, good place. Yeah, 100%. To I was at one and I just said, you know what? If, if my basis that I could be or do whatever I want is true, if I want to be do that, and for me a goal was to play at a major music festival, EDC, then let's put it in motion. Wouldn't that be fun? I've never played an instrument. So Wouldn't that be I fun? Don't, I, don't know, <laughs> I don't know music theory. I don't know anything. And it was it's almost like a um, building trust with myself to show myself that I can do like do what you say you're gonna do in a way like myself like yeah. selfishly. It sounds like a, it sounds like kind of egotistical, but like I did it to show I. I like doing things to show myself that I can do. It's a new mountain too. That's exactly right. So, yep. so for for the the chase of a new mountain, starting at zero, and, and zero, I understand that's naive. I I had resources of, of people and and money and other things like that. So yeah. to say at zero is not correct. <laughs> You're too humble. It, it's not. But 
to start at a low level at something. Knowledge wise, you were at zero. Start at a low level at something and build it up. And um, it, it was was really uh, appealing. Well, it's not, I mean, I feel like it's very common for people at your level or in my world of entrepreneurs. It's like, it's not about the end goal. It's not about the exit of the company and you're happy forever out. It's like literally the act of just learning, working towards something and trying to achieve that one end point. So that makes, that's why I think it's so cool. And I'll thank you. And I'll prove it to you. You ever buy a pair of shoes that you think is fucking awesome, and then yeah. a, a month later, they're in the back of your closet. Get three more. Things become <laughs> relative, right? Mm-hmm. Things become relative. Cars, cars, right? especially Things. cars. But how about a goal? Have you ever wanted to run for me? You know, a marathon, a triathlon. You work for months, and you fucking change your whole lifestyle, and all this, and then you cross the finish line. How long does that good feeling last? Does it last a year, a month, a week, a day, an hour? For most people, it's between an hour and a week that the good feeling lasts. So. I've realized the beautiful thing about life is, for me, meaning of life is to grow and to give. So, mm-hmm. so to continuously grow in any categories, and growth equals happiness for me. So growing in anything is me being happy. It's not the end result. It's not right. the end goal. So to your point, finding new things to grow in is happy. And it's I said fun. It's fun, and it mm-hmm. makes me happy to grow in any category, in any level. If I, As long as I went to bed saying I grew today, I had a, pr- I had a pretty damn good day. I just, and, it has, and, and that also removes the basis of money or material right. or outcomes it's 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 a very achievable outcome and i i, I found I've, I've had a lot more joy in life focused on growing versus things and stuff because it becomes relative and who cares anyway it's all bullshit i think it's really important because most people chase money and think and it's normal until you've experienced it and i think everyone goes through this but i think yeah. one thing that i've learned that it's like so true now it's like to be happy, you've seen like 30 minutes of sunlight, good relationships, people you care about that so you're actively engaged with, and then working on something that you find meaningful or important. Now, listen, it, uh, there's no judgment. of That's happiness. Yes. And there's no, and you mentioned that people finding that because so I can, I can see it on the other end of the screen now. People going, oh, easy for you, dipshit. You're, right. You know, you yeah. Pay yeah. A lot of money, yeah. Right? You know, my dad's a retired cop, NYPD cop. My mom worked in my elementary school. So I was not gifted economically. My, I, I, I worked very hard. I had no investment from anyone. I never raised outside funds. I went from zero to where I am today. And that's not to brag. That's to anyone saying, oh, easy for you. Obsessive learning. Like, Obsessive learning. That is the yeah. key. Over, yeah, yeah, 100%. Where was I, where was I going with that? Um, it was something on the growth, the growth comp. How you can achieve. Maybe, maybe that's what it was. Um, oh, just, oh, excuse me. I was saying, like, if, if someone's focused on, like, material things, no judgment, no fault. I think I think you will find, and if you reflect enough, like you asked me, actually, you were like, I think when we first started, you were like, were you ever like uh, selfish with things? And like, of course, I had a go- I had a goal to make six figures. I had a goal to make a hundred thousand dollars. I did it, and it was probably the longest stint of ever. I'll call it depression is not the right word, but like low feeling. Same. Because I did it, and I was like, now what? And mm-hmm. that now what feeling is very real. And you, everyone listening, has experienced it after mm-hmm. high school. You've experienced it maybe after an accomplishment, any accomplishment, any life-changing event after college. Now what? And that time period is actually really interesting to study in psychology. I think it's Michael Jordan who talks about the first championship is not the hardest. It's the mm-hmm. second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Mm-hmm. The sixth one was the hardest because you did it. So the motivation to win the championship, be a millionaire. And you have every fruit. like yeah. To be a millionaire, all the, that's so easy to find the motivation for that stuff. It's when you've experienced it and you felt that emptiness of now what there's a lot of self-growth that comes during that time period Mm -hmm. to go win it again and again and again and again and i love studying people that are lifelong winners in multiple categories arnold schwarzenegger as an example it's one in multiple categories his entire life i'm not interested in learning someone who had one exit in a business or had has a great relationship for two three years i want to meet someone who's had a 50 year relationship mm-hmm. and they've had so that's a six that's successful to me who's had long-term sustainable success those are the people i want to study and learn and learn from and this is this is no different so anyway so to close at that point if you want a lamborghini if you want this do awesome. it climb the mountain but awesome if that yeah. motivates you i think finding out earlier that that it's a higher octane fuel to be i told you i was, I was motivated for um uh freedom of time at first for myself truly then I was motivated for my brother to ha- not have to ever work. I joke, like have a dick boss. And everyone in my brother, I'm <laughs> okay. low quality. Like he's my best friend. He's so close to me. And I, and one day I woke up and I was like, fuck. I had, I had a boss that was a little bit meaner. And I was like, 
this he's gonna have this one day. I, and that I couldn't sleep with. Like I almost get like mm. up when I think about that. I couldn't sleep with thinking that the person who's closest to me, my brother, is gonna experience a low quality of life if I mm-hmm. don't do something about it. Talk about that for fucking fuel versus someone wanting a new pair of fucking Christian right. batons. Fuck you. I'm gonna work <laughs> sixteen hours a day, seven days a week. I'm gonna outwork the hell out of you because I I got so much more sustainable. So I think Can I ask you a question on that? Just your brother specifically? Yeah. Why do you feel accountable for him? And why would you not say maybe, let's say, he should get off his ass and work as hard as me too? Like, why don't you think he should be your equal in a way? You know. Or hold him to that expectation. Maybe because I'm his older brother. Um, maybe I'm, clo- I'm close to him. Not saying you should think that way by any means. Just because uh, I'm the same way with my close friends. Uh, learning for me is, and I can't remember the book. There's a triad for it. Um, but it's basically like being the hero versus a coach. And I've actually had to learn. Part of my learning process over the last year is being more of a coach than a hero. So what you just said, like being a savior, is actually an egotistical thing too mm-hmm. when you actually break it down. But, you know, how, how teach a man to fish versus like, you know, right. give him fish. And, and for a lot of my life, I've I've done that. My littlest brother, not even that brother, I've given a lot to. And I've actually done him a really bad disservice. I've had that by, experience by too. By spoiling and giving and, and, and really robbed him of his... Um, uh, fulfillment, and that's been a that's been a really that's something I'm actively getting better at and learning. So, to, so to answer your question, I'm still working through that, uh, not being called a hero uh, and and being more of a coach and being more allowing people to find their own path and help guide them or coach them, but not be not come in and save them. I'm 100% the, the savior type as well. Like where I feel like my closest friends, the one who like stuck with me throughout all my ups and downs, supported me. I need like feel responsible for. So I could definitely see it being an ego thing. And, and it's super beautiful. There's nothing to be ashamed of for that. But it's also Good intent. Uh, it's great intent. But there's a middle ground of where you're actually serving serving them, where they where you're robbing them of fulfillment at the end right. of the day. Rob, rob. That's why I ask because I've experienced yeah, that, yeah. or they like kind of yeah, get yeah. comfortable or expect it now, or yeah, they just yeah. I mean, be a selfish pig and do yeah. That. But learning. I think that I think there's a good yeah there's a, there's a good middle ground. Okay, cool. But so then, just back to the DJ thing, are you still pursuing that, or is that just like I want to see if I could perform once, and then I had the experience, it was fun, but not like something you love to death, you it's know? Interesting timing for us talking because my goal was to play at a major music festival. I did in May at EDC, like you mentioned. Um, and it's almost like what I mentioned, like the graduating college, selling a business, you, you know, like, right. like where I'm kind of figuring out how I feel right now about that, mm-hmm. but. Do I put another bar there or do we talked a little bit about like my higher aspirations in, in, in business that, that I'll, I'll be pursuing as well. So and an interesting transition where I, I think I'm, uh, I, I'm still getting clarity on that answer. Yeah. Um, but it's actually a pretty beautiful to have that time period for myself right now with what we're talking about, yeah. where you hit that milestone of, for someone as a Lamborghini for me, it, it was, it was playing at this thing where studying this time period of like growth for yourself like I've got to learn like and do a lot of introspective thinking like why am I doing this what right. more do I want what impact does that make what does that do for me yeah, the uh, DJ lifestyle is a, a di- yeah. probably a different one I can see how that has big implications sure and the difference from anything from being like you probably hit like that top 10% maybe top 1% sure. but the difference from that to the top 0.1% is I want to do grueling that. Exactly. exactly and that, that's and you know it's funny you mentioned that like to, to, to actually answer that a little bit more in, in depth like you know, let's just let's say, okay, I'm at a top ten percent. Maybe I'm not even close, but maybe in my head, I'm at, I'm out where I want it to get, yeah. right? Like to, to a good level, like to go perform at a made stage and have major labels sign you and all this. Am I five, ten years away and a full time commitment to? Yeah, then you have people working around you, and if that, you let them down, and what does that do yeah. for me? Is that my actual goal? And my right. goal is not to be a world famous DJ. <laughs> this is a really fun thing yeah. for me to do and experience, yeah. and really to show. Actually, I talked about my little brother. The coaching, I wanted to show him you could you could be or do whatever you want. That's really cool. So that was actually talking about my motivation again too was not to have to to be cool and fans. It was actually to show my little brother that he could do whatever the hell he. That's wanted awesome. From any level. That's awesome. So that was that was, uh, tr- truthfully, that has been my motivation. And and I, I I can answer with certainty my motivation is not to what you just said go to the one percent to the next level right. on there, which is probably my answer in in what I should do now is kind of start mm-hmm. setting it. Uh, but I do have major aspirations to make a huge impact in the world and run a billion dollar valuation business, not because I want to be a billionaire, not because I want to be filthy rich, but because I believe you need to add enough value to the market in order to be more that kind of valuation at that point. So you need to add enough value to customers, shareholders, employees, and team to be valued at a billion dollars. You need to add a billion dollars worth of value to the world, for lack of a better world. So if you back up and you look at business as a spiritual game, 
it, 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 it very much like you have to deliver, like we talked about, deliver value consistently to your customers, to your employees, to your vendors, to to all these people in order to make money. Like at the end of the day, no one's giving paying you money unless you win the lottery. To, to you may are making the money you've made because of the value you've added to the world. And again, to your team, hundred percent customers, all these people. To me, that's very spiritual. So mm-hmm. I have a benchmark and goal of a billion dollar valuation because I want to add a billion dollars worth of value to the world. Mm-hmm. Probably in mental health is is where it will be. We talked a little bit about it with before. So that that's my next iteration, next chapter in life will be focused on that as I start sunsetting kind of this cool, fun, call it semi, uh, I don't know if distraction is the right word, but fun passion project while also running the business and my investments while also figuring out what I'm going to do next in business. And I really want to emphasize this point for anyone watching this, especially if you're like on your come up or your beginning or wherever you are and you haven't really achieved that level, the million dollar level you think you need to be. People do it for Lambos. They do it for these watches or a nice house or even to just get laid. And they think that once you have these material things, that's going to help you get a girl. But in reality, what you learn is because you see all these successful people with girls or with all these nice things, a great life. What you learn once you get money is it wasn't the money. Those are in and of themselves skills you have to learn. And the people that have money have now had the time to learn those skills to get good at whatever they chose. So the money had no correlation. So if those are things you want, sit down, ask yourself, what do you value? What do you really want? Then just get good at those things because money will come eventually once you're good at those things yeah. and you try to provide that back in the world through value. I think the greatest question is, uh, who do I need to become to get X? Right. And that's a totally different frame than what do I need to do or it, or these other que- or feeling insurmountable. Like, who do I need to, if you want a Lamborghini, who do I need to become in order to get that? Mm-hmm. And, and immediately start thinking about habits and discipline and all these other things and that really make you into a right. good person. I, I believe. Not I, everyone. And no, I agree. Just, but but to a better person, you really work on yourself when you ask yourself, who do I need to become to get X? I think that's the question I would go to, whatever that aspiration is. Who do I, and I even, I'm asking myself that today. If I want to run a billion dollar valuation business in mental health, who do I need to become in order to do that? What actions do I need to take differently? How do I need to think differently? How can I invest in myself differently? in order to be ready for that, which will happen and it will materialize, who do I need to become in order to get there? And um, that that's a really empowering question. That's so important. And that's a mental framework that I've had for anyone listening, you need to adopt this, but constantly, anytime I'm making a decision, I constantly ask myself, is this a decision that a top performing person would make? Is this, is this something that a top performing person would do? And then I can make decisions so quickly. Sh- I shouldn't eat a Pop-Tart. Yeah. No, because a, pop- a top performing person would not eat a Pop-Tart. So. Dude, by far my favorite podcast, and I'll put that in the podcast. <laughs> Anthony Sarandria, guys, follow him on social media. Where can they find you? In Instagram, I, uh, I I try and respond. I'm not try. I do respond to every single person who sends a message. That's how I got him on this podcast. Uh, yeah, that takes me a little bit of time, but I um, it, this is really fun for me. I've had so many podcasts and mentors and people that have I've learned from that I wouldn't be even a quarter of where I am today. So this is a really really fun for me to pay it forward. I appreciate you sharing it, brother. Of course. Thank you so much. Of course. Love.